Good evening, good afternoon, and good morning to you wherever you are in the world, and welcome to the Double Oncom Award winning The Show Must Go Online, bringing you live performed readings of Shakespeare's complete plays with a global cast of all levels of experience every Wednesday. I'm Robert Miles, actor, writer, director, and creator of the Shakespeare Deck. Tonight's season three finale with an all alumni cast, As You Like It, will begin in approximately 15 minutes time. As You Like It is a singularly extraordinary and exuberant show, but at its core is an incredible friendship. On social media this week, we suggested that you bring a friend to As You Like It, whether for a socially distanced or remote watch along. If you and your friend are watching, please tweet us a selfie at TSMG Online Live. Or if you haven't reached out yet, there's still time before the play begins. So think of a friend that might like some Shakespeare and please do bring them along. Please remember to like this video, subscribe to the channel, remembering of course to hit the bell icon to receive all notifications, and remember to follow us at TSMG Online Live on Twitter or at the show must go online on Insta and Facebook. But first, I'd like to tell you about another theatrical event taking place this Saturday, curated as our guest introductions are by the incredible Ben Crystal. Inspired by Shakespeare's Twelfth Night, What You Will is a virtual site-specific theatrical promenade. Giving agency to audiences to choose their own adventure, it asks what the digital arts can offer and how might Shakespeare sit in this new, distant, viral world we find ourselves in, together alone and with so much shared. What You Will takes place live this Saturday, 8th of August at 12pm, 4pm and 7pm BST, with a web version following on the 15th of August. Tickets are free for all or donate what you will, and all proceeds go to support the isolated freelance creatives involved. Details and ticket links can be found at shakespeareensemble.com and you can find a link in the description of this video. Do check it out, I'm sure it's going to be a fascinating exploration. And now to tonight's show, introducing, brought to us by Ben himself, it's Rachel Chung. Rachel Chung is a doctoral candidate at the University of Edinburgh, where she is writing her dissertation on sexual violence in Shakespeare productions by casts of all women. Rachel currently sits on the British Shakespeare Association Committee for Media and Performance, and is a proud member of RSAs, a burgeoning community of scholars studying asexuality and the Renaissance. Rachel, the play is as you like it, and the floor is yours. All right, thank you so much. Um, I'm so excited to be here with you all. Uh, hello from sunny Edinburgh, um, where it only rained twice today. I'm so excited to be involved in this project and I'd like to thank uh, Ben and Rob for putting their faith in me as well as Dr. Nora Williams for recommending me. I'm gonna make you guys look good, I hope. For this intro, I'm going to give you all a whistle stop tour of the plot of As You Like It, focusing just on Rosalind and Orlando, our leading couple. Then I'll give you some of my hottest takes about the play as well as some insights into what it's all about and what you can look out for during the reading. So at the outset of the play, we meet Oliver, a young man who is cast out of his home and robbed of his inheritance by his older brother. We meet Rosalind and Celia. Rosalind's father, the rightful Duke has been banished by Celia's father, the current Duke. Nevertheless, the two cousins are the best of friends. Orlando arrives in court to fight the court wrestler and he and Rosalind are immediately smitten with one another. But following the match, Rosalind is suddenly exiled. So she assumes men's clothes and the name Ganymede and flees into the forest with her cousin. Once she's in the forest, Rosalind runs into the lovesick Orlando who has also conveniently fled into the forest while she is disguised as a boy and she offers to help cure him of this lovesickness. She has him pretend that she is Rosalind, which she is, but he doesn't know that. And she tells him to come woo her every day. Rosalind organizes by the end, a big four couple wedding for all of the various couples that you will see unfurl. And at the very end, Rosalind and Celia reveal themselves and all the couples are happily married. At which point the rightful Duke, Rosalind's father is restored to power and everyone goes home. So, Let's talk about Shakespeare's green world. Um, most of this play takes place in the forest. So I wanted to talk about Shakespeare's green world. The green world refers to the forest, but more specifically to the sovereign self-sufficient world that exists in the forest. The forest is a place of both danger and safety. It's full of wild beasts, gods and fairies, but it 
also frequently provides some sort of refuge to persecuted protagonists, most often to young lovers. Generally speaking, when Shakespeare's lovers flee into the forest, they're met with a microcosmic world already in full swing. The forest is common in Shakespeare's comedies because it often offers a catalyst for the protagonists to conquer their obstacles without violence. It uses miscommunications, switcheroos, and shenanigans to beget a happy ending, which is what we like to see right now. In the case of As You Like It, they are greeted by a cast of peasants and shepherds, each of whom is dealing with their own personal catastrophe. And as you like it, the forest acts as an invert, a polar opposite to civilization. When the legitimate duke is sent into exile, the safety of court is overthrown. The court becomes a place of danger and uncertainty, and the forest itself inverts to match. The forest welcomes Rosalind and Celia. They can exist there in peace, but not as themselves. While they're disguised, Rosalind and Celia are stuck in the in-between between their real lives in which they cannot safely exist and the safe forest where they cannot be themselves. In comedies, Shakespeare's female protagonist frequently disguises herself as a young man. When Rosalind disguises herself as Ganymede, she also mirrors the inverted order of court. In court, Rosalind had no agency. She goes on living there a short while after her father is deposed, but she lives under constant threat of danger or exile. However, as Ganymede, Rosalind becomes the chief driver of the plot. She speaks her mind and she easily commands the other characters, peasants and nobles alike. While as Ganymede, <laughs> sorry, while Rosalind is Ganymede, everything is reversed. Before Rosalind can shed her disguise and leave the forest, everything must first be righted. Unfortunately, this structure necessitates Rosalind's return to some type of domesticity though I would urge you to be on the lookout for anything she says about marriage. We can infer so much about Shakespeare's attitude toward marriage as well as the culture surrounding marriage at the time, which I won't go into, don't worry, just by watching the push and pull for power between Rosalind and Orlando. Uh, in her disguise, Rosalind comes to embody the forest. The forest itself is often gendered as feminine in writings from the era. It is wild and untamed. It is a threat to masculine order. The forest, much like the many forests which used to populate England, must be colonized and subdued. The growth of civilized power necessitates the subjugation of the forest. However, Shakespeare's forests exert profound supernatural power, perhaps speaking to his powerful female characters. As the opposite of the city, the forest is inherently queer and that it deviates from the dictates of government, both by a duke and by a husband. And as you like it, the forest has no known owner, as far as I know, it is unmarried and unfathered. I often joke that the forest makes you gay, but what I really mean is that the forest allows one to inhabit their own otherness, to express something more natural and profound than what civilization allows. The forest mirrors Rosalind's newfound freedom to control her own life and her relationship with Orlando. Their relationship is full of gay panic and sexual tension. Even though it's played for laughs, Orlando's relationship with Ganymede is only allowed in the forest. The queerness of their faux courtship is only allowed within the boundaries of that forest. At the outset of the play, the so-called laws of civility are corrupted and Rosalind must survive without them in order to restore them. In the end, more by chance than anything else, actually, the rightful Duke is restored and everything is made right again. This restoration of what would have been considered the Duke's divine right to rule signals the return to normalcy and Rosalind can return to her role as herself. As you watch this reading, I would encourage you to be on the lookout for any inversions of civilized order, especially when it comes to Rosalind's behavior. I would also ask myself, what happens next? You know, what happens when Rosalind puts on her skirts again and goes back to court. Can Rosalind ever really leave Ganymede with all his freedom and bravery behind in the woods? I'm not sure if I could. Uh, and with that, I'll turn you back over to our brilliant cast. Enjoy the show. 
Thank you so much for that amazing introduction, Rachel. Really appreciate that. Of and course. now, dear Groundlings, the show is about to begin. So please remember to capture your reactions on social using the hashtag show must go online. And please enjoy William Shakespeare's As You Like It. Act 1, Scene 1, An Orchard of Oliver's House. Enter Orlando and Adam. As I remember, Adam, it was upon this fashion bequeathed me by will, but poor a thousand crowns, and, as thou sayest, charged my brother on his blessing to breed me well. And there begins my sadness. My brother, Jakes, he keeps at school, and report speaks goldenly of his profit. For my part, he keeps me rustically at home, or, to speak more properly, stays me here at home unkept. For call you that keeping for a gentleman of my birth, that differs not from the stalling of an ox. Besides this nothing that he so plentifully gives me, the something that nature gave me his countenance seems to take from me. He lets me feed with his hinds, bars me the place of a brother, and as much as in him lies, minds my gentility with my education. This is it, Adam, that grieves me. And the spirit of my father, which I think is within me, begins to mutiny against this servitude. I will no longer endure it, though yet I know no wise remedy how to avoid it. Yonder comes my master, your brother. Go apart, Adam, and thou shalt hear how he will shake me up. Now, sir, what make you here? Nothing. I am not taught to make anything. Marry, sir, be better employed, and be not a while. Shall I keep your hogs and eat husks with them? What prodigal portion have I spent that I should come to such penury? Know you where you are, sir? Oh, very well, here in your orchard. Know you before who, sir? Aye, better than him I am before knows me. I know you are my eldest brother, and in gentle condition of blood you should so know me. The courtesy of nations allows you my better, in that you are the firstborn. But the same tradition takes not away my blood. Were there twenty brothers betwixt us? I have as much of my father in me as you, albeit, I confess, your coming before me is nearer to his reverence. What? Boy! Come, come, elder brother! You are too young in this! Wilt thou lay hands on me, villain? I am no villain. I am the youngest son of Sir Roland de Bois. He was my father, and he is thrice a villain that say such a father begot villains. Wert thou not my brother, I would not take this hand from thy throat till this other had pulled out thy tongue for saying so. Sweet masters, be patient, for your father's remembrance be it accord. Let me go, I say. I will not to thy please. You shall hear me. My father charged you in his will to give me good education. You have trained me like a peasant, obscuring and hiding from me all gentlemanlike qualities. The spirit of my father grows strong in me, and I will no longer endure it. Therefore, allow me such exercises as may become a gentleman. Or give me the poor lottery my father left me by testament, with that I will go buy my fortunes. And what wilt thou do? Beg when that is spent? Well, sir, get you in. I will no, not long be troubled with you. You shall have some part of your will. I pray you leave me. I will no further afford you than becomes me for my good. Get you with him, you old dog. Uh, old dog, is it my reward? <laughs> oh, most true, I've lost my teeth in your service. Oh, God be with my old master, he would not have spoke such a word. 
Is it even so? Begin you to grow upon me? I will physic your rankness and, give, and yet give no thousand crowns neither. Holla, Dennis! Call your worship. Was not Charles, the Duke's wrestler, here to speak with me? So please you, he is here at the door and importunes access to you. Call him in. Will be a good way, and tomorrow the wrestling is. Good morrow to your worship. Good Monsieur Charles, what's the new news at the new court? There's no new news at the court, sir, but the old news. That is, the old duke is banished by his younger brother, the new duke, and three or four loving lords have put themselves into voluntary exile with him, whose lands and revenues enrich the new duke, therefore he gives them good leave to wander. Can you tell if Rosalind, the duke's daughter, be banished with her father? Oh no, for the duke's daughter, her cousin, so loves her, being ever from their cradles bred together, that she would have followed her exile or have died to stay behind her. She is at the court and no less beloved of her uncle than is her own daughter. And never two ladies loved as they do. Where will the old Duke live? They say he is already in the forest of Arden and many merry men with him. And there they live like the old Robin Hood of England. They say many young gentlemen flock to him every day and fleet the time carelessly as they did in the golden world. What, you wrestle tomorrow before the new duke? Marry, do I, sir. A and I came to, to acquaint you with a matter. I am given, sir, secretly to understand that your brother, Orlando, hath disposition to come in disguise against me to try and fall. Tomorrow, sir, I wrestle for my credit. And he that escapes me without some broken limb shall acquit him well. <laughs> your brother is but young and tender. And for your love, I would be loath to foil him. As I must for my love, for, for my honour, if he came in. Therefore, out of my love to you, I came hither to acquaint your withal. That either you might stay him for his attendance, or brook such disgrace well as he shall run it into, and that it is a thing of his own search, and altogether against my will. Charles, I thank thee for thy love to me, which thou shalt find I will most kindly requite. I had myself notice of my brother's purpose herein, and have underhand means labored to dissuade him from it, but he is resolute. I'll tell thee, Charles, it is the stubbornest young fellow of France, full of ambition, an envious emulator of every man's good parts, a secret and villainous contriver against me, his natural brother. Therefore, use thy discretion. I had as lief thou didst break his neck as his finger, and thou wert best look to it. For if thou dost any slight disgrace, or if he do not mightily grace himself on thee, he will practice against thee by poison, entrap thee by some treacherous device, and never leave thee till he hath taken thy life by some indirect means or other. For I assure thee, and almost with tears I speak it, there is not one so young and so villainous this day living. I'm heartily glad I came hither to you. If he come tomorrow, I'll give him his payment. If ever he go alone again, I'll never wrestle for prize no more. And so, good God, keep your worship. Farewell, good Charles. Now will I stir this gamester. I hope I shall see an end of him for my soul, yet I know not why, hates nothing more than he. Yet he's gentle, never schooled, yet learned, full of noble device, of all sorts enchantingly beloved, and indeed so much 
in the heart of the world, and especially of my own people who best know him, that I am altogether misprized. But it shall not be so long this wrestler shall clear all. Nothing remains but that I kindle the boy thither, which now I'll go about. Exit. Act 1, Scene 2. A lawn before the Duke's palace. Enter Rosalind and Celia. I pray thee, Rosalind, sweet my cause, be merry! Celia, I show more mirth than I am mistress of, and would you yet I were merrier? Unless you could teach me to forget a banished father, you must not learn me how to remember any extraordinary pleasure. Oh, herein I see thou loves me not with the full weight that I love thee. If my uncle, thy banished father, had banished thy uncle, the duke my father, so thou hadst been still with me, I could have taught my love to take thy father for mine. So wouldst thou, if the truth of thy love to me were so righteously tempered as mine is to thee. Well, I will forget the condition of my estate to rejoice in yours. <laughs> you know my father hath no child but I, nor none is like to have, and truly, when he dies, thou shalt be his heir. But what he hath taken away from thy father perforce, I will render thee again in affection. By mine honour, I will, and when I break that oath, let me turn monster. <laughs> Therefore, my sweet Rose, my dear Rose, be merry. Henceforth I will, cuz, and devise sports. Mm. Let me see. What think you of falling in love? <laughs> oh, marry, I prithee do to make sport withal. But love no man in good earnest, nor no further in sport neither, than with the safety of a pure blush thou mayst in honour come off again. What shall be our sport then? Let us sit and mock the good housewife Fortune from her, her wheel, that her gifts may henceforth be bestowed equally. I would we could do so, for her benefits are mightily misplaced, and the bountiful blind woman doth most mistake in her gifts to women. Tis true. For those that she makes fair, she scarce makes honest, and those she makes honest, she makes very ill-favouredly. Hey, now thou goest from Fortune's office to Nature's. Fortune reigns in gifts of the world, not in the lineaments of nature. No, when nature hath made a fair creature, may she not by fortune fall into the fire? Though nature hath given us wit to flout at fortune, hath not fortune sent us this fool to cut off the argument? How now, wit? Whither wonder you? Oh, uh, mistress, you must come away to your father. Were well, you made the messenger? No, by mine honour. But I was bid come for you. When I learned you that oath, fool. <laughs> of a certain knight that swore by his honour that they were good pancakes, and swore by his honour that the mustard was naught. Now, I'll stand to it. The pancakes were naught, and the mustard was good, and yet the knight was not forsworn. How prove you that in the great heap of your knowledge? I marry now, unmuzzle your wisdom. Ah, stand forth before you now. Stroke your chins. And swear by your beards that I am not a knave. By our beards, if we had them, thou art. And by my knavery, if I had it, then I were. But if you swear by that, that it is not, you are not forsworn. No more was this knight swearing by his honour, for he never had any. Or if he had, he'd already sworn it all away before he saw those pancakes or that mustard. Oh, oh here comes Monsieur Le Beau. With his mouth full of news. Oh, which you all put on us as pigeons feed their young. Well, then we shall be news crammed. <laughs> all the better. We shall be the more marketable. Bonjour, Monsieur Le Beau. What's the news? Fair princess, you have lost much good sport. Sport? Of what colour? What colour, madam? How shall I answer you? As wit and fortune will. Or as the destinies decrees. Oh, well said. That was laid on with the trowel. Oh, nay, if I keep not my rank, then my eyes will... Thou losest thy old smell. <laughs> you amaze me, ladies. I would have told you a good wrestling, which you have lost the sight of. Yet yeah, tell us the manner of the wrestling. 
I will tell you the beginning, and if it please your ladyships, you may see the end, for the best is yet to do, and here where you are, they are coming to perform it. Oh, well, the beginning lies dead and buried. There comes an old man and his three sons. Oh, I could match this beginning with an old tale. The eldest of the three wrestled with Charles, the Duke's wrestler, which Charles in a moment threw him and broke three of his ribs, that there is little hope of life left in him. So he served the second, and so the third. Yonder they lie, the poor old man their father making such pitiful dole over them that all the beholders take his part with weeping. Alas, but what's the sport, monsieur, that the ladies have lost? Why, this that I speak of. <laughs> Thus men may grow wiser every day. <laughs> it's the first time I've ever heard a break-in of ribs was a sport for ladies. Shall we see this wrestling, cousin? You must if you stay here. For here is the place appointed for the wrestling, and they are ready to perform it. Oh, yonder, sure they're coming. Let us now stay and see it. Come, sir, since the youth will not be entreated his own peril on his forwardness. Yonder the man. Even he, madam. Oh, alas, he looks too young, yet he looks successfully. How now, daughter and cousin? Are you kept hither to see the wrestling? I'm a leech, so please you give us leave. You would take little delight in it, I can tell you. There is such odds in the man. It's a pity of the challenger's youth I would fain dissuade him, but he will not be entreated. Speak to him, lady. See if you can move him. I'll call him hither, Monsieur Mlebeau. Do so, I'll not be by. Monsieur, the challenger, the princess calls for you. I attend them with all due respect and duty. Young man, have you challenged Charles the wrestler? No, fair princess, he is the general challenger. I come but in, as others do, to try and test with him the strength of my youth. <laughs> Young gentlemen, your spirits are too bold for your years. You've seen cruel proof of this man's strength. If you saw yourself with your eyes, or knew yourself with your judgment, the fear of your adventure would counsel you to a more equal enterprise. We pray you, for your own sake, to embrace your own safety and give over this attempt. You young sir, your reputation shall not therefore be misprized. We will make it our suit to the Duke that the wrestling not go forward. I beseech you, punish me not with your hard thoughts wherein I confess me much guilty to deny so fair and excellent ladies anything. <laughs> Let your fair eyes and gentle wishes go with me to my trial, wherein, if I be foiled, there is but one shamed that was never gracious. If killed, but one dead that is willing to be so. I shall do my friends no wrong, for I have none to lament me. The world no injury, for in it I have nothing. Only in the world I fill up a place, which may be better supplied when I have made it empty. The little strength that I have, I would it were with you. And mine, to eke out hers. <laughs> there you will. Pray heaven I be, be deceived in you. Your heart's desires be with you. Come, where is this young gallant that is so desirous to lie with his mother earth? Ready, sir, but his will hath in it a more modest working. You shall try but one fool. No! I warrant your grace, you shall not entreat him to a second that have so mightily persuaded him for a first. No! Sir, you should not have mocked me before, but come your ways. Hercules be thy speed, young man.
if I had a thunderbolt in mine eye, I can tell who should down. Come oh, yes. on, all I know. Yes! Yes, come on! Yes, all I know, come on! No more. Yes, yes. I beseech you. I am not yet well breathed. How dost thou, Charles? Cannot speak, my lord. Bear him away. What is thy name, young man? Orlando, my liege, the youngest son of Sir Roland de Bois. I would thou had been son to some man else. The world esteemed thy father honourable, but I did find him still my enemy. Thou shouldst have better pleased me with this deed, hadst thou descended from another house. But fare thee well, thou art a gallant youth. I would thou hast told me of another father. Where I'm my father, cause when I do this. I am more proud to be Sir Roland's son his youngest son, and would not change that calling to be adopted heir to Frederick. My father loved Sir Roland as his soul, and all the world was of my father's mind. Had I before known that this young man, his son, I should have given him tears unto entreaties ere he should thus have ventured. Gentle cousin, let us go thank him and encourage him. My father's rough and envious disposition sticks me at heart. Sir, you have well deserved. If you do keep your promises in love, but justly as you have exceeded all promise, your mistress shall be happy. <laughs> Gentlemen, wear this for me, one out of suits with fortune that could give more, but that her hand la lacks means. Shall we go, cuz? I fare you well, fair gentleman. Can I not say I thank you? My better parts are all thrown down, and that which here stands up is but a quintain, a, a mere lifeless block. He calls me back. My pride fell with my fortunes. I'll ask him what he will. Did you call, sir? Sir, you have wrestled well and overthrown more than your enemies. Will you go, Cos? Enough with you. Fare you well. What passion hangs these weights upon my tongue? I cannot speak to her, yet she urged conference. O oh, poor Orlando, thou art overthrown, or Charles or something weaker masters thee. Good sir, I do in friendship counsel you to leave this place. I'll bite you have deserved high commendation, true applause and love. Yet such is now the Duke's condition that he misconstrues all that you have done. Thank you, sir, and pray you tell me this. Which of the two daughters was of the Duke that here was at the wrestling? Neither his daughter, if we judge by manners. But it, yes, indeed, the smaller is his daughter, the other is daughter to the banished Duke, and here detained by her usurping uncle to keep his daughter company whose loves are dearer than the natural bond of sisters. But I can tell you that of late this Duke hath taken displeasure against his gentle niece, grounded by no other argument, but that the people praise her for her virtues and pity her for her good father's sake. And on my life, his malice against the lady will suddenly break forth. Sir, fare you well. Hereafter in a better world than this, I shall desire more not love and knowledge of you. I rest much bound into you, fare you well. Thus must I from the smoke into the smother, from tyrant duke unto a tyrant brother, but heavenly Rosalind. Exit. Act one, scene three, a room in the Duke's palace, and Cecilia and Rosalind. Why, cousin, why, Rosalind? Cupid have mercy, not a word. Not one to throw at a dog. <laughs> no, thy words are too precious to be cast upon curs. Throw some of them at me. Come, lay me with reasons. Then there were two cousins laid up, when the one should be lamed with reasons and the other mad without any. Is all this for your father? No, 
some of it is for my child's father. <laughs> oh, how full of briars is this working day world? Oh, they are but birds, cousin, thrown upon me in holiday foolery. I could if we walk not in the trodden paths, our very petticoat will catch them. I could shake them off my coat. These birds are in my heart. Hem them away. I would if I could cry hem and have him. Oh, come, come. Wrestle with thy affections. <laughs> oh, they take the part of a better wrestler than myself. Oh, good wish upon you. You will try in time in despite but turning these jests out of service, let us talk in good earnest. Is it possible, on such a sudden, you should fall into so strong a liking with old Sir Roland's youngest son? The Duke, my father, loved his father dearly. Mm, doth it therefore ensue that you should love his son dearly? By this kind of taste, I should hate him. But my father hated his father dearly, yet... I hate not Orlando. No, Faith, I hate him not for my sake. Oh, why should I not? Doth he not deserve well? Let me love him for that, and you do love him because I do. Look, here comes the Duke. It is ice full of anger. Mistress, dispatch you with your safest haste and get you from our court. Me, uncle? You, cousin, within these ten days, if that thou beest found so near our public court as twenty miles, thou diest for it. I do beseech your grace, let me the knowledge of my fault bear with me. If I with myself, I hold intelligence or have acquaintance with mine own desires, that I do not dream or, or be not frantic, as I do trust I am not, then, dear uncle, never so much as in a thought unborn did I offend your highness. Thus do all traitors in their purgation did consist in words. They are as innocent as grace itself. Let it suffice thee that I trust thee not. Yet your mistrust cannot make me a traitor. Tell me whereon the likelihood depends. Thou art thy father's daughter, there's enough. So was I when your highness took his dukedom. So was I when your highness banished him. Treason is not inherited, my lord. Or if we did derive it from our friends, what's that to me? My father was no traitor. Then, good my liege, mistake me not so much to think my poverty is treacherous. Yes, sovereign, hear me speak. I see, dear. We stayed her for your sake, else she with her father ranged along. I did not then entreat to have her stay. It was your pleasure and your own remorse. I was too young to that time to value her, but now I know her. If she be a traitor, why, so am I. We still have slept together, rose at an instant, learned, played, eat together, and wheresoever we went like Juno swan, still we went coupled and inseparable. She is too subtle for thee, and her smoothness, her very silence, and her patience speak to the people, and they pity her. Thou art a fool. She robs thee of thy name, and thou wilt show more bright and seem more virtuous when she is gone. Then <laughs> open not thy lips. Firm and irrevocable is my doom, which I have passed upon her. She is banished. Pronounce that sentence then on me, my liege. I cannot live out of her company. You are a fool. You niece, provide yourself. If you outstay the time upon mine honour and in greatness of my word, you die. Oh, my poor Rosalind, whither wilt thou go? Will thou change fathers? I will give thee mine, I charge thee, be not thou more grieved than I am. I have more cause. Thou hast not, cousin, prithee be cheerful. Knowst thou not the Duke hath banished me, his daughter? That he hath not. No, hath not. Rosalind then lacks the love which teacheth thee that thou and I am one. Shall we be sundered? Shall we part, sweet girl? No. Let and therefore, 
devise with me how we lie, whither to go and what to bear with us, and do not seek to take your change upon you and bear your griefs yourself and leave me out. For by this heaven, at our sorrows pale, say what thou canst, I'll go along with thee. Why, whither shall we go? To seek my uncle in the forest of Arden. Alas, what danger will it be to us, maids as we are, to travel forth so far? Beauty provoke a thief sooner than gold. I'll put myself in poor and mean attire, and with a kind of umber smirch to my face. The like do you. So shall we pass along and never stir assailants. Were it not better, because that I am more than common tall, that I did suit me all points like a man? <laughs> a gallant curtilax upon my thigh, a, a boar spear in my hand and in my heart, Lie there what hidden women's fear there will. We'll have a swashing and a martial outside, as many other mannish cowards have that do outface it with their semblances. <laughs> what shall I call thee when thou art a man? I'll have no worse name than Job's own page. And look, you call me Ganymede. Oh, Ganymede. <laughs> what will you be called? Um, something that hath a reference to my state. No longer Celia, but uh, Alien. <laughs> <laughs> Cousin, what if we essayed to seal the clownish fall out of your father's court? Would he not be a comfort to our travel? Oh, he'll go along over the wide world with me. Leave me alone to woo him. Let's away and get our jewels and our wealth together. Devise the fittest time and safest way to hide us from pursuit that will be made after my flight. Now, go we in content to liberty and not to banishment. <laughs> Exeunt. Act 2, Scene 1, The Forest of Arden. Enter Duke Senior, Amiens, and two or three lords like foresters. Now, my co-mates and brothers in exile, hath not old custom made this life more sweet than that of painted pomp? Are not these woods more free from peril than the envious court? Here feel we not the penalty of Adam, the season's difference, the icy fang and churlish chiding of the winter's wind, which, when it bites and blows upon my body, even till I shrink with cold, I smile and say, this is no flattery. These are counselors that feelingly persuade me what I am. Sweet are the uses of adversity, which, like the toad, ugly and venomous, wears yet a precious jewel in his head, and, and this our life exempt from public haunt finds tongues in trees, books in the running brooks, sermons in stones, and good in everything. I would not change it. Happy is your grace that can translate the stubbornness of fortune into so quiet and so sweet a style. <laughs> Come, shall we go and kill us venison? And yet, it irks me. The poor, dappled fools, being native burghers of this desert city, should in their own confines, with forked heads, have their round haunches gored. Indeed, my lord. The melancholy Jakes grieves at that. In that kind, uh, where's you do more usurp than doth your brother that hath banished you? <laughs> uh, today, my lord of Amien to myself did steal behind him as he lay along under an oak, whose antique root peeped out upon the brook that brawled along this wood to the witch place. A poor sequestered stag that from the hunter's aim had taken hurt, he'd come to languish. And indeed, my lord, the wretched animal heed for such groans that their discharge did stretch his leathern coat almost to bursting. And the big round tears coursed one another down his innocent nose in piteous chase. And thus the hairy fool, much marked of the melancholy Jakes, stood on the extremest verge of the swift brook, augmenting it with tears. What said Jakes? Did he not moralize this spectacle? Oh yes, into a thousand similes. First, fierce weeping into the needless stream. Poor dear, quoth he, thou makest a testament as worldlings do giving thy sum of more to that which had too much. Then, being there alone, left and abandoned of his velvet friends, tis right, quoth he, 
thus misery doth part the flux of company. Anon, a careless herd, full of pasture, jumps along by him, and never stays to greet him. I, quoth Jakes, sweep on, you fast and greasy citizens, tis just the fashion. Wherefore do you look upon that poor and broken bankrupt there? And thus, most effectively, he pieceth through the body of the country, city, court, and yea, this, our life, swearing that we are mere usurpers, tyrants, and, what's worse, to fright and kill the animals in this their assigned and native dwelling place. And did you leave him in this contemplation? We did, my lord, weeping and commenting upon the sobbing deer. Show me the place. I love to cope him in these sullen fits, for then he is full of matter. I'll bring you to him straight. Exeunt. Act two, scene two, the Duke's palace. Enter Duke Frederick with lords. Can it be possible that no man saw them? It cannot be. Some villains in my court are of consent and sufferance in this. I cannot hear of any that did see her. The, the ladies, her attendants of her chamber, saw her abed. And in the morning early they found the bed un untreasured of their mistress. My lord, the royish clown at whom so oft your grace was wont to laugh is also missing. Hesperia, the princess's gentlewoman, confesses that she secretly overheard your daughter and her cousin much commend the parts and grace of the wrestler, but they did but lately foil the sinewy Charles. And she believes wherever they are gone, the youth is surely in their company. Send to his brother, fetch that gallant hither. If he be absent, bring his brother to me. I'll make him find him. Do this suddenly, and let not search an inquisition quail to bring again these foolish runaways. Exeunt. Act two, scene three, before Oliver's house. Enter Orlando and Adam, meeting. Who's there? What? My young master, oh, my gentle master, oh, my sweet master, oh, you memory of old Sir Roland. Why, why what made you here? No, you're not master to some kind of men. Their graces served them but as enemies. Why, what's the matter? Oh, unhappy youth, come not within these doors. Within this roof, the enemy of all your graces lives. Your brother, no, no brother. Yet the son, yet not the son. I will not call him son of him. I was about to call him father. Hath heard your praises. And this night he means to burn the lodging where you used to lie. And you within it. If he fail of that, he will have other means to cut you off. I overheard him and his practices. This is no place. This house is but a butchery. Abhor it. Fear it. Do not enter it. Oh, whither, Adam, wouldst thou have me go? No matter whither. So you come not here. Wouldst thou have me go and beg my food? Or with a base and boisterous sword enforce a thievish living on the common road? This I must do, or know not what to do. Yet this I will not do, do how I can. I rather will subject me to the malice of a diverted blood and bloody brother. Do not so! I have five hundred crowns, the thrifty hire I saved under your father, which I did store to be my foster nurse, nurse when service should in my old limbs lie lame. Take that! And he that doth the ravens feed, ye providently cater for the sparrows, be comfort to my old age. Here, here, here is the gold. All this I give you. Let me be your servant, though I look old. Yet I am strong and lusty. 
for in my youth I never did apply hot and rebellious liquors in my blood. Therefore is my age as a lusty winter, frosty but kindly. Oh, let me go with you. In all your business and necessities, I'll do the service of a younger man. Oh, good old man. How well in thee appears the constant service of the antique world, when service sweat for duty, not for mead. Thou art not for the fashion of these times, where none will sweat but for promotion, and having that do choke their service up even with the having. It is not so with thee, but poor old man, thou prunest a rotten tree, that cannot so much as blossom yield in lieu of all thy pains and hubs husbandry. Oh. What well, come thy ways, we'll go along together, and ere we have thy youthful wages spent, we'll light upon some settled love content. Master, go on, and I will follow thee to the last gasp with truth and loyalty. Exeunt. Act 2, Scene 4, The Forest of Arden. Enter Rosalind for Ganymede, Celia for Aliena, and Clown alias Touchstone. Oh, Jupiter, how weary are my spirits? Oh, I care not for me spirits, if me legs were not weary. I could find it in my heart to disgrace my man's apparel and to cry like a woman. But I must comfort the weaker vessel, as doublet and hose ought to show itself courageous to petticoat. Therefore, courage, good Eliana. Oh, I pray you be with me. I cannot go no further. <laughs> well, for my part, I'd rather bear you than bear with you. I'd rather bear with you than bear you. Yet I should bear no cross if I did bear you, for I think uh, you have no money in your purse. Well, this is the forest of Arden. Aye, now I'm in Arden. The more fool I. When I was at home, oh, I was in a better place, but, uh, well, travellers must be content. I be so good, Touchstone. Look you, here comes a, here come, who comes here? A young man and an old in solemn talk. That is the way to make her scorn you still. Oh, Corin, that thou knewst how I do love her. I partly guess, for I have loved her now. <laughs> no, Corin, being old, thou canst not guess. Though in thy youth thou waste as true a lover as ever sighed upon a midnight pillow. But if thy love were ever like to mine, as sure I think did never man love so, how many actions most ridiculous hast thou been drawn to by thy fantasy? Into a thousand that I have forgotten. <laughs> oh, thou didst then never love so heartily. If thou rememberest not the slightest folly that ever love did make thee run into, thou hast not loved. Or if thou hast not sat as I do now, Wearing thy hearer in thy mistress's praise, thou hast not loved. Or if thou hast not broke from company abruptly, as my passion now makes me, thou hast not loved. <sighs> oh, Phoebe, Phoebe, Phoebe. Thus, poor shepherd, searching of thy wound, I have by hard adventure found mine own. Uh, and mine. See, I remember when I was in love, Oh, I broke my sword upon a stone and bid him take that for coming at night to Jane's smile. I remember the cow's dung that her pretty chopped hands had milked. I remember the wooing of a peas cod instead from her whom I took two, two cods, giving them her again said with weeping tears, where these for my sake? We are that true lovers run into strange capers. But all is mortal in nature, so is all nature in love, mortal folly. Thou speakest wiser than thou art aware of. Oh, may I never be aware of what my shins can break against. Jove, Jove, this shepherd's passion is much upon my fashion. Yeah, mine, it grows something stale within me. Oh, I pray you, one of you question yond man. If he for gold will give us any food, I faint almost to death. Holla, you clown! Peace, fool! He's not thy kinsman. Who calls? Your better, sir. <laughs> Else are they very wretched. I say, good even, good even to you, friend. And to you, gentle sir, and to you all. I prithee, shepherd, if that love all gold can in this desert place buy entertainment, 
Bring us where we may rest ourselves and feed. Here's a young maid with travel much oppressed and faints for succour. Oh, fair sir, I pity her, and I wish for her sake more than for my own. My fortunes were more than able to relieve her, but I'm shepherd to another man. I do not shear the feces that I graze, and my master is of a, a churlish disposition, a little wrecks to find the way to heaven by doing deeds of hospitality. <laughs> Besides, his cot, his flocks and bounds of feed are now on sale, and at our sheep cot now, by reason of his absence, there is nothing that you will feed on. But what is, come see, and in my voice most welcome shall you be. <laughs> Tis he that shall buy his flock and pasture. Well, that young swain that you saw here for e'er a while, that little cares for buying anything. I pray thee, pray thee, if I stand with honesty, buy thou the cottage, pasture, and the flock, and thou shalt have to pay for it a buzz. And we will mend thy wages. I like this place, and willingly could waste my time in it. I'm assuredly the thing is to be sold. Go with me, if you like, upon report, the soil, the profit, and this kind of life, I will your very faithful feeder be, and buy it with your gold, <laughs> right suddenly. Exeunt. Act 2, Scene 5, another part of the Forest of Arden. Enter Amiens, Jakes, and Lords. Under the greenwood tree, loves to lie with me and turn his merry note unto the sweet bird's throat come hither come hither come hither here he shall see no enemy but winter in rough weather. More! More! I prithee, more! It will make you melancholy, Monsieur Jakes. I thank it. More! I prithee, more! I can suck melancholy out of a song as a weasel sucks eggs. More! I prithee, more! My voice is ragged. I know it cannot please you. I do not desire you to please me. I do desire you to sing. Come, more. Another stanza. Call you him stanzas? What you will, Monsieur Jakes. Nay, I care not for their names. They owe me nothing. Come, sing. And you that will not, hold your tongues. Well, I'll end the song. Sirs, cover the while. The Duke will drink under this tree. He hath been all this day to look you. And I have been all this day to avoid him. He is too disputable for my company. I think of as many matters as he, but I give heaven thanks and make no boast of them. Come, warble, come. Who doth ambition shun, who loves to live in the sun, seeking the food he eats and pleased with what he gets? Come hither, come hither, come hither. Here he shall see no enemy but winter and rough weather. <laughs> I'll give you a verse to this note that I made yesterday in despite of my invention. Oh, and I'll sing it. Thus it goes. Yeah. If it do come to pass that any man turn us, leaving his wealth and ease, a stubborn will to please, duc dame, duc dame, Duc dame, here shall he see gross fools as he, and if he will come to me. What's that, Duc dame? It is a Greek invocation to draw fools in a circle. I'll go sleep if I can. And I'll go seek the Duke. His banquet is prepared. Exeunt. Act 2, Scene 6, another part of the Forest of Arden. Enter Orlando and Adam. Dear Master, 
I can go no further. I die for food. Oh, let me lie here. Measure me out my grave. Oh, farewell, young master. Why? How now, Adam? Is a heart in thee? Live a little. Comfort a little. Give thyself a little. If this uncouth forest yield anything savage, I will either be food for it or bring it for food to thee. Thy conceit is nearer death than thy powers. For my sake, be comfortable. Hold death a while. I will here be with thee presently, and if I bring thee not something to eat, I will give thee leave to die. But if thou diest before I come, thou art a mocker of my labour. <laughs> and I'll be with thee quickly, yet thou liest in the bleak air. Come, I will bear thee to some shelter. Not die for lack of dinner if there is anything in this desert. Cheerly, good Adam. Exeunt. Act 2, Scene 7. Another part of the Forest of Arden. A table set out. Enter Duke Senior, Amiens, and Lords like outlaws. I think he'd be transformed into a beast, for I can nowhere find him like a man. My lord, he is but even now gone hence. Here he was merry, hearing a song. If he compact of jars grow musical, we shall shortly have, have discord in the spheres. Go, seek him. Tell him I would speak with him. Oh, he saves my labour by his own approach. Well, how now, Mansoor? What a life is this, that your poor friends must woo your company? What, you look merrily. A fool! I met a fool in the forest of Motley. Oh, ah, miserable world. As I do live by food, I met a fool who laid him down and basked him in the sun and railed on Lady Fortune in good terms, in good set terms, and yet a motley fool. Good morrow, fool, quoth I. No, sir, quoth he, call me not fool till heaven hath sent me fortune. And then he drew a dial from his uh, poke and looking on it with lackluster eyes, says very wisely, it is 10 o'clock. Thus we may see, quoth he, how the world wags. Ah, tis but an hour ago since it was nine and in one hour more, it will be 11. And then from hour to hour we run. Weep and ripe, and then from hour to hour we rot and rot, and uh, thereby hangs the tale. <laughs> when I did hear the motley fool thus moral on the time, my lungs began to crow like shanty clear that fools should be so deep contemplative, and I did laugh. Stones into me should an hour go by his dial. <laughs> Noble fool, a worthy fool. Motley's the only way. What fool is this? A worthy fool, one that hath been a courtier and says, if ladies be but young and fair, they have the gift to know it. And in his brain, which is as dry as the remainder biscuit after a voyage, he hath strange places crammed with observation, the which he vents in mangled forms. Oh, that I were a fool. I am ambitious for a motley coat. Thou shalt have one. It is my only suit, provided that you weed your better judgments of all opinions that grow rank in them that I am wise. I must have liberty withal, as neither Charter has the wind to blow on whom I please, for so fools have. The wise man is folly is anatomized even by the squandering glances of the fool. Invest me 
in my motley. Give me leave to speak my mind, and I will through and through cleanse the foul body of the infected world, if they will patiently receive my medicine. Oh, fie on thee! I can tell what thou wouldst do. What, for a counter, would I do but good? A most mischievous foul sin, in chiding sin, for thou thyself hast been a libertine, as sensual as the brutish thing itself, and all the embossed sores and headed evils that thou, with license of free foot, hast caught, wouldst thou disgorge into the general word, world. <laughs> but who comes in? For mm. and eat no more. Why? I have not none yet. Nor shalt not till necessity be served. What? What kind should this cock come of? Art thou thus boldened, man, by thy distress? Or else a rude despiser of good manners that in civility thou seem'st so empty? You touched my vein at first. The thorny point of bare distress had ta'en from me the show of smooth civility. Yet am I inland bred and know some nature. But forbear, I say. He dies that touches any of this fruit till I and my affairs are answered. Well, if you will not be answered with reason, I must die. What would you have? Your gentleness shall force more than your force move us to gentleness. I almost die for food. And let me have it! Sit down and feed. Welcome to our table. Speak you so gently. Pardon me, I, I pray you. I thought that all things had been savage here. And, <laughs> and therefore put I on the countenance of stern commandment. But where'er you are that in this desert inaccessible, under the shade of melancholy boughs, lose and neglect the creeping hours of time, if e'er you looked on better days, if ever you've been where bells have knolled to church, if ever sat in any good man's feast, if ever from your eyelids wiped a tear and know what is to pity and be pitied, let gentleness my strong enforcement be, in which the hope I blush and hide my sword. True is it that we have seen better days and half with holy bell been knolled to church and sat at good men's feasts and wiped our eyes of drops that sacred pity hath engendered and therefore sit you down in gentleness and take upon command what help we have that to your wanting may be ministered Th then but forbear your food a little while whilst like a doe i go to find my fawn and give it food <laughs> There is an old poor man who after me hath many a weary step limped in pure love, till he be first sufficed, oppressed with two weak evils, age and hunger. I will not touch a bit. Go, find him out, and we will nothing waste till you return. I thank you, and be blessed for your good comfort. Oh. Thou seest, we are not all alone unhappy. This wide and universal theater presents more woeful pageants than the scene wherein we play in. All the world's a stage. And all the men and women merely players. <laughs> they have their exits and their entrances, and one man in his time plays many parts. His acts being seven ages. At first the infant, mewling and puking in the nurse's arms. Then, the whining schoolboy with his satchel and shining morning face, creeping like snail unwillingly to school. And then the lover, sighing like furnace, with a woeful ballad made to his mistress, I rout. And then a soldier, full of strange oaths and bearded like the part, <laughs> jealous in honor, sudden and quick in quarrel, seeking the bubble reputation, even in the cannon's mouth. And then the justice in fair round belly with good cape on mind, with eyes severe and beard a formal cut, full of 
wise swords and modern instances. And so he plays his part. The sixth age shifts into the lean and slippered pantaloon with spectacles on a nose and pouch on side. His youthful hose well saved, a world too wide for his shrunk shank, and his big manly voice turning again towards childish treble. And which shows in his shell. Last scene of all that ends this strange eventful history is second childishness and near oblivion. Sans teeth, sans eyes, sans taste, sans anything. Welcome, set. <coughs> Welcome, set down your venerable burden and let him feed. I thank you most for him. <laughs> so, had you need, I can scarce speak to thank you for myself. Welcome, fall to. <laughs> oh, I will not trouble you as yet to question you about your fortunes. Uh, give us some music and good cousin, sing. so unkind has man's ingratitude thy tooth is not so keen because thou art not seen although thy breath be rude hi ho sing hi ho unto the green holly most friendship is feigning most loving your folly then i ho the holly this life is most jolly freeze freeze thou better sky that does not bite so nigh as benefits forgot though thou the waters warp thy sting is not so sharp as friends remember not i ho sing i ho unto the green ollie most friends Ship is feigning most loving near folly then i hold the holly this life is most jolly hi ho oh. <laughs> now if, if if you if that you were the good sir roland's son as you have whispered faithfully you were be truly welcome hither i am the duke that loved your father the residue of your fortune, go to my cave and tell me. Good, good old man, thou art right welcome as thy master is. Support him by the arm. Give me your hand and let all, let me all your fortunes understand. Exeunt. Act three, scene one, the Duke's palace. Enter Duke Frederick, Lords and Oliver. Not seen him since, sir, sir, that cannot be. Find out thou brother, wheresoever he is, seek him with candle, bring him dead or living within this twelve month, or turn thou no more to seek a living in our territory. Thy lands and all things that thou dost call thine were seizure to we seize into our hands, till thou, till thou canst quit thee by thy brother's mouth of what we think against thee. That your highness knew my heart in this. I never loved my brother in my life. More villain thou. Well, push him out of doors and let my officers of such nature make an ascent upon this house and land. Do this expediently and turn him going. Exeunt. Act 
Act 3, Scene 2, The Forest of Arden. Enter Orlando with a paper. Hang there, my verse, in witness of my love. And thou, thrice crowned queen of night, survey with thy chaste eye from thy pale sphere above thy huntress name that my full life doth sway. Oh, Rosalind, these trees shall be my books, and in their barks my thoughts I'll character, that every eye which in this forest looks shall see thy virtue witnessed everywhere. Run, run, Orlando, carve on every tree. The fair, the chaste, the unexpressive tree. And how like you this shepherd's life, Master Touchstone? Hmm. Truly, shepherd, in respect of itself, it's a good life, but in that respect, it's a shepherd's life, and it's not. In respect that it's solitary, hmm, I like it very well, but in respect that it's private, it's a very vile life. Now, in respect that it in the fields, it pleaseth me well. But in respect that it's not in the court, it is tedious. Now, as it is a spare life, look you, it fits my humour well. But in respect, there, there is no more as plenty in it, as much goes against my stomach. What's any philosophy in thee, Shepherd? No more, but that I know the more one sickens, the worse at ease he is. He that wants money, means, and content is without three good friends. The property of rain is to wet and fire to burn. That good pasture makes fat sheep. And that a great cause of the night is lack of the sun. Or that he that hath learnt no wit by nature nor art may complain of good breeding. Or comes of a very dull kindred. Such one is a natural philosopher. Was never in court, shepherd. (laughs) No, truly. (laughs) But now art damned. <laughs> I hope. Truly, thou art damned, like an ill-roasted egg, all on one side. But not being in court, you reason. Well, if thou wast never in court, then thou never sourced good manners. And if thou never sourced good manners, then thy manners must be wicked, and wickedness is a sin, and sin is damnation. Thou art in a parlous state, shepherd. Not a wit touchstone. Those that are good manners at court are as ridiculous in the country as the behaviour of the country is most mockable at the court. But you told me you salute not at the court, but you kiss your hands. That curtsy would be uncleanly if courtiers were shepherds. <laughs> Instance, briefly, come. Instance. But we are still handling our ewes. Oh, and they're fell, you know, they're greasy. Ah, uh, yeah. Why do not your courtiers' hands sweat? Mm? And is not the grease of a mutton as wholesome as the sweat of a man? Shallow. Shallow. A better instance, I say, come. Besides, our hands are hard. (laughs) Your lips will feel them sooner. Shallow again. One more sounder instance. Come. And they are all often tarred over with the surgery of our sheep. And would you have us kiss tar? The courtier's hands are perfumed with civet. Most shallow man. Thou worms meat in respect of a good piece of flesh indeed. Learn of the wise and prepend. Civet is one of a baser birth than tar, the very uncleanly flux of a cat. Mend the instant, shepherd. You have too courtly a wit for me. I'll rest. Wilt thou rest, damned? God help thee, shallow man. God make incision in thee. Thou art raw. Sir, I am a true labourer. I earn that I eat, get that I wear, owe no man hate, envy no man's happiness, glad of other men's good, and content with my harm. And the greatest of my pride is to see my ewes graze and my lambs suck. Ah, that is another simple sin in you. To bring the ewes and the rams together (laughs) and to offer to get your living by the copulation of cattle. To be bored to bellwether and to betray a she lamb of a twelve month to a crooked plated old cookly ram. <gasps> Out of reasonable match. If thou be not damned for this, the devil himself will have no shepherds. I cannot see how else thou shouldst escape. Oh, here 
here comes young Master Ganymede, my new mistress's brother. From the east to western end, no jewel is like Rosalind. Her worth being mounted on the wind, through all the world bears Rosalind. All the pictures fairest lined are but black to Rosalind. Let no face be kept in mind, but the hair of Rosalind. Our rhyme is eight years or so. Dinners, suppers, and sleeping hours expected. It's the right to butter the woman's rank to market. Out, fool. Up for a taste. Give a heart. Do like a hind. Let him seek out Rosalind. If the cat will have to kind, so be sure will Rosalind. Wintered gardens will be lined. So must slender Rosalind. That reap and sheep and knife must bind. Then cart with Rosalind. Sweet nut hath the sourest rind. Such a nut is Rosalind. And he that sweetest rose shall find must find love's pricker and Rosalind. This is the very false gallop of verses. Why do you infect yourself with them? Peace, you dull fool. I found them on a tree. <laughs> Truly, the tree yields bad fruit. I'll graph it with you, and then I shall graph it with a meddler. Then it will be the earliest fruit in the country, for you will be rotten ere you be half ripe, and that's the right virtue of the meddler. You've said, but whether wisely or no, let the forest judge. Peace. Here comes my sister reading. Stand aside. Why should this a desert be, for it is unpeopled? No! Tongues I'll hang on every tree, that shall civil sayings show. Some, how brief the life of man, runs his erring pilgrimage, that the stretching of a span buckles in his sum of age. Some of violated vows, twixt the souls of friend and friend, but upon the fairest boughs, or at every sentence end, will I, Rosalinda, write, teaching all that read to know, the quintessence of every sprite, heavenward in little show. Helen's cheek, but not her heart, Cleopatra's majesty, Atalanta's better part, Ooh, Rosalind, sad Lucretia's modesty. Thus Rosalind of many parts by heavenly sithered was devised, of many faces, eyes and hearts, to have the touches dearest prized. Heaven would that she these gifts should have, and I to live and die her slav. Oh, so most gentle Jupiter, what tedious. Oh, love, have you wearied your parishioners with, and never cried, have patience, good people. Oh, how now? Back, friends. Shepherd, go off a little. Go with him, um, sir. Shepherd, let's make an honourable retreat, and though with not the bag and baggage, yet with scrip and scrippage. Didst thou hear these verses? Oh, yes, I heard them all, and more, too, for some of them had in them more feet than the verses would bear. But didst thou hear without wondering how thy name should be hanged and carved upon these trees? I was seven of the nine days out of the wonder before you came, for look here what I found on a palm tree. <laughs> <laughs> well, true you who hath done this. Is it a man? And a chain that you once wore about his neck. Hmm. Oh, change your colour. I prithee, who? Oh, Lord, Lord, it is a hard matter for men, friends to meet, but mountains may be removed with earthquakes and so encounter. Nay, hey, but who is it? Is it possible? Nay, hey, I prithee, now with most petitionary vehemence, tell me who it is! Oh, wonderful, wonderful, and most wonderful, wonderful. <laughs> And yet again, wonderful. And after all that, out of all, hooping. With my <laughs> complexion, dost thou think, though I am comparison like a man, I have a doublet and hose in my disposition? And the inch of delay more is a south sea of discovery. I prithee, tell me who it is quickly and speak apace. I would thou could stammer that thou mightst pour this concealed man out of thy mouth as wine comes out of a narrow-mouthed bottle, either too much at once or none at all. I prithee, take the cork out of thy mouth that I may drink thy tidings! So you may put a man in your belly. <laughs> Is he of God's making? 
What manner of man? Is his head worth a hat? Or, or is his chin worth a beard? Mm, nay, he hath but a little beard. Oh, my God, we'll send more if it, the man will be thankful. Let me stay the growth of his beard, if thou delay me not the knowledge of his chin. It is young Orlando that tripped up the wrestler's heels and your heart both in an instant. <laughs> the devil take mocking, speak sad brow and true maid. My faith, cause tis he! Orlando. Orlando. Last the day! What shall I do with my doublet and hose? What did he when thou sourced him? What what said he? How looked he? Wherein went he? What makes he here? Did he ask for me? Where remains he? How parted he with thee? And when shalt thou see him again? Answer me in one word. Well, you must borrow me Gargantua's mouth first, to the word too great for any mouth of this age's size. To say a and no to these particulars is more than to answer in a catechism. But does he know that I am in this forest and in man's apparel? Looks he as freshly as he did the day he wrestled? It is as easy to count atomies as to resolve the propositions of a lover, but take a taste of my finding him and relish it with good observance. One, two, three. I found him under a tree, like a dropped acorn. It may well be called Job's tree when it drops such fruit. Give me audience, good madam. Proceed. There lay he, stretched along like a wounded knight. Oh, though it be a pity, it well becomes the ground. Ah, cry holler to thy tongue, I prithee, it curveth unseasonably. <clears throat> he was furnished like a hunter. <gasps> Ominous, he comes to kill my heart. I would sing my song without a burden. Thou brings me out of tune. Do you not know I am a woman? When I think, I must speak. Sweet, say on. You bring me out. Oh, soft. Comes not he here? Did he slip by and note him? Why, thank you for your good company. Uh, but, good face, I had as least have been myself alone. And so had I. But yet, for fashion's sake, I thank you too for your society. God buy you. And uh, let's meet as little as we can. I do desire we may be better strangers. I pray you, ma, no more trees with writing love songs in their bark. So pray you, ma, no more of my verses with reading them ill favouredly. Roslyn is your love's name? Yes, just. Uh, what stature is she? As just as high as my heart. Oh, you are full of pretty answers. Have you not been acquainted with uh, goldsmith's wives and condom out of rings? Not so, but I answer you, right painted cloth, from whence you have studied your questions. Oh, you are full of pretty answers. Oh, you have a nimble wit. <laughs> I think it was made of Atalanta's heels. Will you sit down with me, and we two will rail against our mistress, the world, and all our misery? I will chide no breather in the world but myself, against whom I know most faults. The worst fault you have is to be in love. It is a fault I will not change for your best virtue. I am weary of you. By my troth, I was seeking for a fool when I found you. Oh. He's drowned in the brook. Look but in, and you shall see him. <laughs> there shall I see mine own reflection. Which I take to be either a fool or a cipher. I'll tarry no longer with you. Farewell, good signor La. Glad of your departure. Adieu, good monsieur Melancholy. I will speak to him like a saucy lackey, and under that habit play the name with him. <clears throat> Do you hear, Forrester? Very well. What would you? What what a clock is? You should ask me what time of day. There is no clock in the forest. Ah, then there is no true lover in the forest. Else sighing every minute and groaning every hour would detect the lazy foot of time as well as a clock. 
Why not the swift foot of time? Had that, that not been as proper? Oh, by no means, sir. Time travels in diverse paces with diverse persons. I'll tell you who time ambles with all, who time trots with all, who time gallops with all, and who he stands still with all. I prithee, who doth he trot with all? Marry, he trots hard with a young maid between the contract of her marriage and the day it's solemnized, if the interim be but a senite. Time's pace is so hard that it seems the length of seven years. Who ambles time withal? With a priest that lacks Latin and a rich man that hath not the gout, for the one sleeps easily because he cannot study, and the other lives merrily because he feels no pain. The one lacking the burden of lean and wasteful learning, the other knowing no burden of heavy, teddy, tedious penury. These time ambles with all. Who doth he gallop with all? Oh, with a thief to the gallows, for though he go as softly as foot can fall, he thinks himself too soon there. Who stays it still with all? <laughs> with lawyers in the vacation, for they sleep between term and term, and then they perceive not how time moves. Where dwell you? <laughs> you. With this shepherdess, my sister, here in the skirts of the forest, like fringe upon a petticoat. <clears throat> Are you native of this place? As the coney that you see dwell where she is kindled. My accent is something finer than you could purchase and so removed. Of <laughs> I have been told so of many, but indeed an old religious uncle of mine taught me to speak, who was in his youth an inland man, one that knew courtship too well, for there he fell in love. I have heard him read many lectures against it, and I thank God I am not a woman to be touched with so many giddy offences as he hath generally touched their whole sex withal. Can you remember any of the principal evils that he laid to the charge of women? Oh, there were none principal. They were all like one another as halfpence are. Every one fault seeming monstrous till his fellow fault came to match it. I prithee recount some of them. No. I will not cast away my physic, but on those that are sick. There is a man haunts the forest that abuses our young plants with carving Rosalind on their barks, hangs odes upon hawthorns and elegies upon brambles, all forsooth deifying the name of Rosalind. If I could speak to that fancy monger, I would give him some good counsel, for he seems to have the quotidian of love upon him. I am he that is so love-shaked. I pray you, tell me your remedy. There is none of my uncle's marks upon you. He taught me how to know a man in love, in which cage of rushes I am sure you are not prisoner. What were his marks? A lean cheek, which you have not. A blue eye and sunken, which you have not. An unquestionable spirit, which you have not. A beard neglected, which you have not. But I pardon you for that, simply for your having in beard is a younger brother's revenue. Then your hose should be ungartered. Your bonnet unbanded, your sleeve unbuttoned, your shoe untied, and everything about you demonstrating a careless desolation. But you are no such man. You are rather point device in your accoutrements, as loving yourself than seeming the lover of any other. Fair youth, I would I could make thee believe I love. Me believe it. You may as soon make her that you love believe it, which I warrant she is apter to do than she confess she does. That is one of the points in which women still give the lie to their consciences. But in good sooth. Are you he that hangs the verses on the trees wherein Rosalind is so admired? I swear to thee, youth, by the white hand of Rosalind, I am that he, that unfortunate he. But are you so much in love as your rhymes speak? Neither rhyme nor reason can express how much. Love is merely a madness, and I tell you, it deserves as well a dark house and a whip as madmen do. And the reason why they are not so punished and cured is that the lunacy is so ordinary that the whippers are in love too. Yet I profess curing it by counsel. Did you ever cure any so? Yes, one. And in this manner, he was to imagine me his love his mistress, and I set him every day to woo me, at which time would I, being but a moonish youth, grieve, be 
effeminate, changeable, longing and liking, proud, fantastical, apish, shallow, inconstant, full of tears, full of smiles for every passion something, but no passion truly anything as boys and women are, for the most part, cattle of this colour, would now like him, now loathe him, then entertain him, then forswear him, now weep for him, then spit at him, that I drave my suitor from his mad humour of love to a living humour of madness, which was to forswear the full stream of the world and to live in a nook merely monastic. And thus I cured him. And this way, Will I take upon me to wash your liver as clean as a sound sheep's heart, that there shall be not one spot of love in it? I would not be cured, youth. I would cure you if you would but call me Rosalind, and come every day to my cot and woo me. <gasps> By faith of my love, I will. Tell me where it is. Go with me. I'll show it to you. And by the way, you shall tell me where in the forest you live. Will you go? With all my heart, good youth. Nay, you must call me Rosalind. <laughs> Come, sister, will you go? Exeunt. <laughs> Hello there, Grandlings. This is your five minute interval. You now have five minutes to refresh your drinks, refresh yourselves and prepare for the second half starting at approximately 20 to 9 BST. Uh, if you have any questions for myself, the production team or our guest introducer, do let us know. Otherwise, please be ready for the second half to begin in approximately five minutes time. Uh, while I've got you, please do like this video, subscribe to the channel, and make sure that you are posting your reactions to social media using the hashtag showmustgoonline, tag us at TSMG Online Live on Twitter, and at the show must go online on Insta and Facebook. While I still have you, now might be a good time for you to book your ticket to the Shakespeare Ensemble's What You Will, a virtual site-specific theatrical promenade inspired by Twelfth Night. There's a link in the description. Sarah, how are you doing to this evening? <laughs> Good, thank you. I'm having a delightful time. <laughs> Me too. I'm really enjoying it. It's wonderful, wonderful stuff. Hi, Henry. Yeah. Good to see you. The uh, wrestling has been getting lots of love in the live chat already. It was lovely. Yeah, it was great. <laughs> well, we actually have a question here from Danielle. Uh, how long did the wrestling prep take? <laughs> Uh, surprisingly less than I thought, actually. It was actually quite quite, quite straightforward, isn't it, Rob? I mean, I think we did, yeah, we, we did like maybe like an hour on Sunday, something yeah. like that, like from 9.30 to 10.30. Uh, and then I had um, like 40 minutes with them on Monday, like in the one-to-one, like -one, and that's it, pretty much. So, yeah, it was... Uh, it was all straightforward. I mean, I mean, with with Michael and, and and Luke, you can do whatever you want, and it will look amazing. You know what I mean? Because they are so physically talented. Absolutely. They, they I mean, whatever you give them, they they'll just take it and and, and fly with it because they they mean they know what they're doing. So you give them a bit of choreography, and they will pick it up straight away, and they will play it straight away from the moment. You were throwing so many ideas about like because I mean, my knowledge of wrestling is not that good, but but you have an an encyclopedic uh, knowledge of uh, res wrestling moves, I must say, Rob. I, I was very, very surprised about all your knowledge of the Boston Crab and the, and the, <laughs> and the power bomb and super kick and things that I had no freaking clue. So, <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, it's been a mission to make Shakespeare for everyone, obviously, but I love the idea of introducing people who might be into so-called high culture to a bit of low culture. Uh, and yes, wrestling has been, uh, I was tempted to say a guilty pleasure then, but it's not, it's just a pleasure. It's just great fun. And everyone should give professional wrestling a chance. It's larger than life, gymnastic, physical theater done to the nth degree. And it's absolutely delightful. Um, over to you now, Sarah, do we have any uh, Patreon updates this week? Um, I do, yes, and there's a, a question which I'd like to put to, to us all as well, but I will Wonderful. start with our lovely patrons. So again, as always, thank you so much to everyone for your continued support. It makes such a huge difference for everyone involved in the projects and your generosity is hugely appreciated. Uh, so I have some uh, thank yous to do for this week. 
so we have Alistair D, Peter B, Clyde and Kathy W, uh, Joseph S and Claudia, um, who has increased her uh, donation, which is wonderful. So a huge, huge thank you to all of you for supporting us and coming on board. You are going to be tweeted uh, to some more exclusive content as always coming on the platform in the next few days. So do keep your eyes peeled on that. And if you would like to access that exclusive content and you aren't already a supporter, then please head over to the Patreon link, which is in the video description. Um, and you can sign up uh, to as little as, as you um, uh, are able to give uh, <laughs> to support the project. Marvellous. And then I think yeah. you said you had a question for us. Yes, I do. So someone asked, um, uh, which I thought would be lovely to start with you, actually, Rachel, but um, about um, there's lots of lovely characters in this play. So do we have a favourite? <laughs> Ooh, do I have a favourite? OK. I mean, this may be like cliche, but I really love Rosalind. <laughs> Um, I saw this play when I was a teenager. It was one of my earliest encounters with Shakespeare as like a thinking brain. Um, and I was a bit of a tomboy growing up and I was very outspoken. And as you have probably gathered a huge nerd. So I love Rosalind. Um, I connected with her so strongly. And then there's always Jacques, Jacques, depending on your dramaturgical bent, um, <laughs> who I love just because he's so emo that he leaves the play. He's like, this is too, I, sorry to spoil it. If you're, if you didn't know, Jayquiz is very sad, which I love also. Love it so much. And uh, a quick follow-up question, Rachel, as well. Is there anything in yeah. particular that you're looking forward to in the second half of this play? Ooh, well, I don't want to give too much away, but I am looking forward to some twists and turns, some reveals, some very exciting supernatural interventions um, that I think make this play so different from like Much Ado, which I would consider kind of its counterpart in a lot of ways. Um, and it just comes out of left field, but in the best way possible. So looking forward. It really does, everyone. <laughs> so uh, that's all we have time for, for our interval. That's flown by. Thank you all so much for joining us. Uh, more from our cast after the show. If you stick around for our post-show talk, uh, please do uh, remember to uh, like and subscribe to post your reactions on uh, Twitter and social media uh, and make sure to visit our shop as well. We now have a Redbubble merchandise shop that you can go to for all kinds of TSM Joe merchandise, some of which might have made a cameo in tonight's show. Show. And without further ado, please enjoy the second half of William Shakespeare's As You Like It. Act 3, Scene 3, another part of the Forest of Arden. Enter Touchstone, Audrey, and Jake's behind. Uh, come a pace, Audrey. I'll, uh, I'll fetch up your goats. Audrey, and, uh, and how, Audrey? I Go away. Ow, ow. No, get off it. Ow! Uh. And how, Audrey? Am I the man yet? Come on, down, down you go. Down you go, go. There we go. Down you go. Whew. Does my uh, simple feature content you? No feature? Lord warrant us what feature? <laughs> Truly, I wish the gods had made thee more poetical. I do not know what poetical is. Is it is it honest in deed and word? Is it a true thing? No, truly, for it's the truest poetry, most feigning, and uh, oh, lovers are given to poetry. Mm, what they swear in poetry may be said as lovers they do in vain. Then do you wish that the gods then made me poetical? Ah, I do, truly, for thou... Ooh, for thou swearest to me, thou art honest. Now, if thou wert a poet, I might have some hope that thou didst feign. Uh, would you not have me honest? No, truly, unless thou wert hard favoured. To be honestly coupled for this beauty is to have honey to a sauce to sugar. Mm, a material fool. Well, I am 
not fair and therefore I pray to the gods to make me honest. Truly, and to cast away honesty upon a foul slut were to put good meat into an unclean dish. Well, I am not a slut, though I thank the gods I am foul. <laughs> Well, praise be to the gods for thy foulness. Slutty shit, sluttiness may come hereafter. But be as it may, I will marry thee. And to that end, I have been with Sir Oliver Martext, the vicar of the next village, who hath promised to meet me here in this place of the forest and couple us. I would fain see this meeting. Oh, the gods give us joy. Amen. A man may, if he were of a fault, a heart, stagger in this attempt. For here we have, uh, well, no temple but the wood, and no assembly but a uh, horn beasts. Yeah. Uh, but what though? Courage, as <laughs> horns are odious. They are <laughs> necessary. <laughs> well, that is the dowry of his wife. Tis none of his own getting. Is the single man therefore blessed? No! As a walled town is more worthier than a village, so is the forehead of a married man more honourable than a bare brow of a bachelor. Ah! Here comes Sir Oliver. Sir Oliver Martex! You are well met. Will you uh, dispatch us here under this uh, tree, or shall we go with you to the chapel? Is there none here to give the woman? <laughs> I will not take her on any gift of any man. Uh, no, truly, she must be given, or the marriage is not lawful. No. Proceed. Proceed, I'll give her. Oh, good even. Good, master, what you call it? How, how do you, sir? You are very well met. God ailed you, sir, for your last company. I am glad to see you. Even a toy in hand, sir. Nay, be covered. Be covered. Will you be married, Motley? As the ox hath his bow, sir, as the horse has his curb, and the falcon her bells, so man hath his desires, as pigeon's bill, so wedlock would be nibbling. And will you, being a man of your breeding, be married under a bush like a beggar? Get you to church and have a good priest that can tell you what marriage is. This fellow will but join you together as they join wainscot. Oh. And then one of you will prove a shrunk panel and like green timber warp, warp. I'm not in the mind. But if I were to be married of him, then of another, for he is not like to marry me well. And not being well married is a good excuse for me to hereafter leave my wife. Go thou with me, and let me counsel thee. Come, sweet Audrey. We must be married, or we must live in Baudry. Farewell, good Master Oliver. Woo! Tis no matter. Ne'er a fantastical knave of them all shall flout me of my calling. Mm. Exit. Act 3, Scene 4, another part of the Forest of Arden. Enter Rosalind and Celia. Never talk to me, I shall weep. Oh, do I prithee, but yet have the grace to consider that tears do not become a man. But have I not cause to weep? As good cause as one would desire, therefore weep. His hair is of the very dissembling colour. Oh, something browner than Judas's. Marry, his kisses are Judas's own children. My faith, his hair is of a good colour. Oh, an excellent colour. Um, your chestnut was ever the only colour. His kissing is as full of sanctity as the touch of holy bread. Hmm, he hath bought a pair of cast lips of Diana. A nun of winter's sisterhood kisses not more religiously. The very ice of chastity is in them. Why did he swear he would come this morning and comes not? Nay, certainly there is no truth in him. Not true in love? Yes, when he is in. But I think he is not in. You have heard him swear downright he was. Was, not is. Besides, the oath of a lover is no stronger than the word of a tapster. They're both the confirmer of false reckonings. 
He attends here in the forest on the Duke, your father. I met the Duke yesterday and had much question with him. He asked me of what parentage I was. I told him of as good as he, so he laughed and let me go. <laughs> but what talk we of fathers when there is such a man as Orlando? Oh, that's a brave man. He writes brave verses, speaks brave words, swears brave oaths and breaks them bravely. But also brave that youth mounts in folly guides. Who comes here? Oh, mistress and master, you have oft inquired after the shepherd that complained of love, who you saw sitting by me on the turf, praising the proud, disdainful shepherdess that was his mistress. Well, and what of him? If you will see a pageant truly played between the pale complexion of true love and the red glow of scorn and proud disdain, go ahead, Sir Little, I shall conduct you, if you'll mark it. Oh, come, let us remove. The sight of lovers feedeth those in love. Bring us to this sight, and you shall say, I'll prove a busy actor in their play. Exeunt. Act three, scene five. Another part of the Forest of Arden. Enter Silvius and Phoebe. Sweet Phoebe, do not scorn me. Do not, Phoebe, say that you love me not, but say not so in bitterness the common executioner whose heart the custom sight of death makes hard falls not the axe upon the humbled neck that first begs pardon will you sterner be he than he that dies and lives by bloody drops i would not be thy executioner i fly thee for i would not injure thee thou tellst me there is murder in mine eye Tis pretty and sure and very probable that eyes that are the frailest and softest things who shut their coward gates on atomies should be called tyrants, butchers, murderers. Now I do frown on thee with all my heart, and if mine eyes can wound, now let them kill thee. Scr Scratch thee, but with a pin, and there remains some scar of it. Upon a rush, cicatrice and the capable impressure, thy palm a moment keeps. But now, mine eyes, which I have darted at thee, hurt thee not. Nor I am sure there is no force in eyes that can do hurt. Dear Phoebe, if ever as that ever may be near, you meet in such fresh cheek the power of fancy, then shall you know the wounds invisible that love's keen arrows make. But till that time, come not thou near me, and when that time comes, afflict me with thy mocks, pity me not, as till that time I shall not pity thee. Why, I pray you? Who might be your mother that you insult, exult, and all at once over the wretched? What, though you have no beauty, as by my faith I see no more in you than without candle may go to bed, must you be therefore proud and pitiless? Why? What, what means this? Why, why do you look on me? I see no more in you than in the ordinary of nature's sales work. Oh, to my little life, I think she means to tangle my eyes too. No, faith! Proud mistress, hope not after it. It is not your inky brows, your black silk hair, your bugle eyeballs, your cheek of cream that can entain my spirits to your worship. You uh, foolish shepherd, wherefore do you follow her like foggy south puffing with wind and rain? You are a thousand times a proper man than she a woman. It is such fools as you that make the world full of ill-favoured children. It is not her glass, but you that flatters her, and out of you she sees herself more proper than any of her lineaments can show her. But, mistress, know yourself down on your knees, and thank heaven fasting for a good man's love. For I must tell you, friendly, in your ear, sell when you can. You are not for all markets. Cry the man mercy. Love him. Take his offer. Foul is most foul, being foul to be a scoffer. So, 
take her to thee, shepherd. Fare you well. Sweet youth, I pray you chide a year together. I had rather hear you chide than this man woo. He's fallen in love with your foulness, and she'll fall in love with my anger. If it be so, as fast as she answers thee with frowning looks, I'll source her with bitter words. Why look you so upon me? For no ill will I bear you. I pray you, do not fall in love with me, for I am falser than vows made in wine. Besides, I like you not. If you will know my house, tis at the tuft of the olives where, where hard by. Will you go, sister? Shepherd, ply her hard. Come, sister, shepherdess, look on him better and be not proud. Though all the world could see, none could be so abused in sight as he. Come, to our flock. Dead shepherd, now I find thy saw of might. Whoever loved that loved not at first sight. Sweet Phoebe. What, what sayest thou, Silvius? Sweet Phoebe, pity me. Why, I am sorry for thee, gentle Silvius. Wherever sorrow is, relief would be. If you do sorrow at my grief in love, by giving love your sorrow and my grief were both exterminated. Thou hast my love. Is that not neighborly? I would have you. Why, that were covetousness. Silvius, the time was that I hated thee. And yet it is not that I bear thee love, but since thou canst talk of love so well, thy company, which erst was irksome to me, I will endure and I'll employ thee too. But do not look for further recompense than thine own gladness that thou art employed. So holy and so perfect is my love, and I in such poverty of grace that I shall think it a most plenteous crop to glean the broken ears after the man that the main harvest reaps. Loose now and then a scattered smile, and that I'll live upon. Knowest thou the youth that spoke to me your while? Not very well, but I have met him oft, and he hath bought the cottage and the bounds that the old carl at once was master of. Think not I love him, though I ask for him. Tis but a peevish boy. Yet he talks well, but, but what care I for words? Yet words do well when he that speaks them pleases those that hear. It is a pretty youth, not very pretty, but sure he's proud. And yet his pride becomes him, he'll make a proper man. The best, him in, the best thing in him is his complexion, and faster than his tongue did make offense, his eye did heal up. He is not very tall, yet for his years he's tall. His leg is but so-so, and yet tis well. There was a pretty redness in his lip, a little riper and more lusty red than that mixed in his cheek. Twas just the difference between the constant red and mingled damask. There be some women, Silvius, had they marked him in parcels as I did, would have gone near to fall in love with him. But for my part, I love him not, nor hate him not, and yet have more cause to hate him than to love him. For what had he to do to chide at me? He said, mine eyes were black and my hair black, and now I am remembered, scorned at me. I marvel why I answered not again, but that's all one, omittance is no quittance. I'll write him a very taunting letter, and thou shalt bear it, wilt thou, Silvius? Phoebe, with all my heart. I'll write it straight, the matter's in my head and in my heart. I will be bitter with him and passing short. Go with me, Silvius. Exeunt. Act 4, Scene 1, The Forest of Arden. Enter Rosalind and Celia and Jakes. I prithee, pretty youth, let me be better acquainted with thee. They say you are a melancholy fellow. I am, so I do love it better than laughing. Those that are in extremity of either are abominable fellows and betray what? themselves to every modern censure worse than drunkards. Why? Tis good to be sad and say nothing. Why, then, tis good to be a post. 
I have neither the scholar's melancholy, which is emulation, nor the musicians, which is fantastical, nor the courtiers, which is proud, nor the soldiers, which is ambitious, nor the lawyers, which is politic, nor the ladies, which is nice, nor the lovers, which is all these, but it is a melancholy of mine own compounded of many symbols, extracted from many objects, and indeed the sundry contemplation of my travels, in which my often rumination wraps me in a most humorous sadness. A traveller, by my faith, you have great reason to be sad. I fear you have sold your own lands to see other men's. Then to have seen much and to have nothing is to have rich eyes and poor hands. Yes, I have gained my experience. And your experience makes you sad. I had rather have a fool to make me merry than experience to make me sad and to travel for it too. Good day and happiness, dear Rosalind. Nay, then God buy you and you talk in blank verse. Farewell, Monsieur Traveller. Why, how now, Orlando, where have you been all this while? You, a lover, and you serve me such another trick. Never come in my sight any more. My fair Rosalind, I come within an hour of my promise. Break an hour's promise in love? He that will divide a minute into a thousand parts and break but a part of the thousandth part of a minute in the affairs of love? It may be said of him that Cupid has clapped him on the shoulder, but I'll warrant him heart whole. Pardon me, dear Rosalind. Nay, and you be so tardy, come no more in my sight. I had as lief be wooed of a snail. A snail? I of a snail, for though he comes slowly, he carries his house on his head. A better jointure than, I think, than you make a woman. Besides, he brings his destiny with him. What's that? Why, horns, which such as you are fain to be beholding to your wives for. But he comes armed in his fortune and prevents the slander of his wife. Virtue is no hornmaker, and my Rosalind is virtuous. And I am your Rosalind. Come, come, woo me, for now I am in a holiday humour and like enough to consent. What would you say to me now, and I were your very, very Rosalind? I would kiss before I spoke. Nay, hey, you were better speak first, and then when you were graveled for lack of matter, you might take occasion to kiss. Very good orators, when they are out, they will spit, and for lovers lacking, God warn us matter, the cleanlier shift is to kiss. How if the kiss be denied? Then she puts you to entreaty, and there begins new matter. Who could be out being before his beloved mistress? Marry, that should you, if I were your mistress, or I should think my honesty ranker than my wit. What, of my suit? <laughs> Not out of your apparel, and yet out of your suit. I'm not I, your Rosalind. I take some joy to say you are, because I would be talking of her. Well, in her person, I say, I will not have you. Then in mine own person, I die! No, faith, by attorney. The poor world is almost 6,000 years old, and in all this time, there was not any man died in his own person. Videla said, in a love cause, Troilus had his brains dashed out with a Grecian club. Yet he did what he could do to a die before, and he is one of the very patterns of love. Leander, who would have lived many a year, though Hero had turned none, if it had not been for a midsummer hot night. For, good youth, he went but forth to wash him in the Hellespont, and, being taken with the cramp, was drowned. But these are all lies. Men have died from time to time, and worms have eaten them, but not for love. I would not have my right Rosalind of this mind, for I protest her frown might kill me. By this hand it will not kill a fly. But, come now, I will be your Rosalind in a more coming on disposition, and ask me what you will, I will grant it. Then love me, Rosalind. Yes, faith will I, Fridays and Saturdays and all. And wilt thou have me? Aye, and twenty such. 
are you not good? I hope so. Why then can one desire too much of a good thing? Come, sister, you shall be the priest and marry us. Give me your hand, Orlando. <laughs> what do you say, sister? Pray thee, marry us. You must begin. Will I you? cannot say the words. Will you, Orlando? Go to! Orlando, will you, Orlando, have to wife this Rosalind? I will. I, but when? Why now? <laughs> as fast as you can marry us. And you must say, I take thee, Rosalind, for wife. I take thee, Rosalind, for wife. I must ask you for your commission, but I do take thee, Orlando, for my husband. As a girl goes before the priest, and certainly a woman's thoughts runs before her actions. So do all thoughts, they are winged. Now, tell me how long you would have her after you have possessed her. Forever and a day. Say a day without the ever. No, no, Orlando. Men are April when they woo, December when they wed. Maids are May when they are maids, but the sky changes when they are wives. I will be more jealous of thee than a Barbary cock pigeon over his head, more clamorous than a parrot against rain, more newfangled than an ape, more giddy in my desires than a monkey. I will weep for nothing, like Diana in the fountain, and I will do that when you are disposed to be merry. I will laugh like a hyena, and that when thou art inclined to sleep. But will my Rosalind do so? By my life. She will do as I do. Oh, but she is wise. Or else she could not have the wit to do this. The wiser, the waywarder. Make the doors upon a woman's wit, and it will out at the casement. Shut that, and it will out at the keyhole. Stop that, it will fly with the smoke out at the chimney. And that had a wife with such wit. <laughs> he might say, wit, whither wilt? Nay. Hey. You might keep that check for it till you meet your wife's wit going to your neighbour's bed. And what wit could wit have to excuse that? Marry, to say she came to seek you there. You shall never take her without her answer unless you take her without her tongue. Oh, that woman that cannot make her fault her husband's occasion, let her never nurse her child herself, for she will breed it like a fool. For these two hours, Rosalind, I will leave thee. Alas, dear love! I cannot lack thee two hours. I have to the Duke at dinner. By two o'clock I will be back with thee again. I go your ways, go your ways. I knew what you would prove. My friends told me as much, and I thought no less. The flattering tongue of yours won me. Tis but one cast away, and so come death. Two o'clock is your hour. Aye, sweet Rosalind. By my troth, and in good earnest, and so God mend me, and by all pretty oaths that are not dangerous, if you break one jot of your promise, or come one minute behind your hour, I will think you the most pathetical break promise, and the most hollow lover, and the most unworthy of her you call Rosalind, that may be chosen out of the gross band of the unfaithful. Therefore, beware my censure, and keep your promise. With no less religion than if thou wert indeed my Rosalind. So, adieu. Well, time is the old justice that examines all such offenders, and let time try. Adieu. You have simply misused our sex in your love prate. We must have your doublet and hose plucked over your head for all the world to see, and show the world what the bird hath done to her own nest. Oh, cuz, 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 my pretty little cuz, that thou didst know how many fathom deep I am in love. But it cannot be sounded. My affection hath an unknown bottom like the Bay of Portugal. Or rather, bottomless. Fast as you pour it in, it runs out. No, that same wicked bastard of Venus that was begot of thought, conceived of spleen, and born of madness, that blind, rascally boy that abuses everyone's eyes because his own are out, let him be the judge how deep I am in love. I'll tell thee, Aliena, I cannot be out of the sight of Orlando. I'll go find a shadow and sigh till he come.
Then I'll sleep. Exeunt. Act 4, Scene 2, another part of the Forest of Arden. Enter Jakes and Lords as foresters. Which, which is he that killed the deer? Sir, it was I. Let's present him to the Duke like a Roman conqueror. And it would do well to set the deer's horns upon his head for a branch of victory, eh? Have you no song, Forrester, for this purpose? Yes, sir. Sing it. Tis no matter how it be in tune, so it make noise enough. What shall I have to kill the deer? His leather skin and horns to wear, then sing him The rest shall bear this burden. Hit thou no scorn to wear the horn. It was a crest if thou born. Thy father, father wore it. And thy father bore it. The horn, the horn, the lusty horn is not a thing to laugh, to scorn. The lusty horn. Exeunt. Act 4, Scene 3, another part of the Forest of Arden. Enter Rosalind and Celia. How say you now? Is it not past two o'clock? And here, much Orlando. Oh, I warrant you, with pure love and troubled brain, he hath ta'en his bow and arrow and he's gone forth to sleep. Look who comes here. My errand is to you, fair youth. My gentle Phoebe did bid me give you this. I know not the contents, but as I guess by the stern brow and waspish action which she did use as she was writing of it, it bears an angry tenure. Pardon me, I am but as a guiltless messenger. Patience herself would startle at this letter and play the swaggerer. Bear this, bear all. She says, I am not fair, that I lack manners. She calls me proud, <laughs> and that she could not love me were man as rare as phoenix. What's my will? Her love is not the hare that I do hunt. Why writes she so to me? Well, Shepherd, well, this is a letter of your own device. No, I protest, I know not the contents. Phoebe did write it. Come, come, you are a fool and turned into the extremity of love. I say she never did invent this letter. This is a man's adventure and his hand. Sure, it is hers. Why, it is a boisterous and a cruel style, a style for challenges. Why, she defies me. Will you hear the letter? So please you, for I never heard it yet. It heard too much of Phoebe's cruelty. She Phoebe's me. Mark how the tyrant writes. Art thou God to shepherd turned, that a maiden's heart hath burned? Can a woman rail thus? Call you this railing? Why thou Godhead laid apart, warest thou with a woman's heart? Did you ever hear such railing? Whilst the eye of man did woo me, that could do no vengeance to me, meaning me a beast. If the scorn of your bright eyne have power to raise such love in mine, a lack in me what strange effect would they work in mild aspect? Whilst you chide me, I did love, how then might your prayers move? He that brings this love to thee, little knows this love in me, and by him seal up my mind, whether that thy youth and kind will the faithful offer take of me and all that I can make. Or else, by him, my love deny, and then I'll study how to die. <laughs> Call you this chiding? Oh, alas, poor shepherd. Do you pity him? No, uh, he deserves no pity. Wilt thou love such a woman? What, to make thee an instrument and play false strains upon thee? Not to be endured. Well... Go your way to her, for I see love hath made thee a tame snake, and say this to her. 
that if she love me, I charge her to love thee. If she will not, I will never have her unless thou entreat for her. If you be a true lover, hence, and not a word, for here comes more company. Good morrow, fair ones. Uh, pray you, if you know, where in the purlieus of this forest stands a sheep coat fenced about with olive trees? Uh, west of this place, uh, down in the neighbour bottom, the rank of osiers by the murmuring stream, left on your right hand, brings you to the place. But at this hour, the house doth keep itself. There's none within. If that an eye may profit by a tongue, then should I know you by description? Such garments and such years, the boy is fair of female favor and bestows himself like a ripe sister, the woman low and browner than her brother. Are not you the owner of the house I did inquire for? It is no boast be an ass to say we are. Orlando doth commend him to you both. And to that youth he calls his Rosalind, he sends this bloody napkin. Are you he? I am. What must we understand by this? Some of my shame, if you will know of me, what man I am, and how, and why, and where this handkerchief was stained. Well, I pray you tell it. When last the young Orlando parted from you, he left a promise to return again within an hour and pacing through the forest, chewing the food of sweet and bitter fancy, lo what befell. He threw his eye aside and mark what object did present itself under an old oak whose boughs were mossed with age and high top bald with dry antiquity, a wretched ragged or grown with hair man lay sleeping on his back about his neck a green gilded snake had wreathed itself who with her head nimble in threats approached the opening of his mouth but suddenly seeing orlando it unlinked itself and with indented glides did slip away into a bush under which bushes shade a lioness with udders all drawn dry, lay couching head on ground with cat-like watch when that the sleeping man should stir. For tis the royal disposition of that beast to prey on nothing that doth seem as dead. This scene Orlando did approach the man and found it was his brother, his elder brother. Oh, I've heard him speak of that same brother and he did render him the most unnatural that lived among men. And well he might so do, for well I know he was unnatural. But to Orlando, did he leave him there? Food to the sucked and hungry lioness? Twice did he turn his back, and purposed so. But kindness, nobler ever than revenge, and nature stronger than his just occasion, made him give battle to the lioness who quickly fell before him, in which hurtling from miserable slumber, I awaked. Are you his brother? Was he you rescued? Was you he rescued? Or was to he who did officer contrive to kill him? Twas I, but tis not I. I do not shame to tell you what I was, since my conversion so sweetly tastes being the Thing I am. But for the bloody napkin? By and by, when from the first to last betwixt us two, tears our recountments had most kindly bathed as how I came into that des desert place. In brief, he led me to the gentle duke who gave me fresh array and entertainment, committing me into my brother's love who led me instantly unto his cave. There stripped himself and here upon his arm the lioness had torn some flesh away, which all this while had bled. And now he fainted and cried in fainting upon Rosalind. Brief, I recovered him, bound up his wound, and after some small place, being strong at heart, he sent me hither, strange, stranger as I am, to tell this story, that you might excuse his broken promise and give this napkin 
died in his blood unto the sh shepherd youth that he in sport doth call his Rosalind. Oh, why, how now, Ros? Ganymede, sweet Ganymede. Uh, many will swoon when they do look on blood. Oh, there is more in it. Cousin Ganymede. Uh, look, he recovers. Oh, I would, I were at home. We'll lead you thither. I pray you, will you take him by the arm? Oh, 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 oh. <laughs> be of good cheer, youth. You a man? You lack a man's heart. I do so, I confess it. Ah, uh, oh, Sirrah, a body would think this was well counterfeited. I pray you, tell your brother how well I counterfeited. <laughs> hey ho! This was not counterfeit. There is too great testimony in your complexion that it was a passion of earnest. <laughs> counterfeit, I assure you. Well then. Take a good heart and counterfeit to be a man. So I do, but if faith I should have been a woman by right. Come mm -hmm. you, paler and paler. Pray you draw homewards. Good sir, go with us. That will I, for I must bear answer back. How you excuse my brother, Rosalind. I shall devise something, but I, I pray you commend my counterfeiting to him. Will you go? Exeunt. Act 5, Scene 1, The Forest of Arden. Enter Touchstone and Audrey. We shall find a time. Audrey, patience, gentle Audrey. Oh, the freight the priest was good enough for all the old gentlemen saying. A most wicked Oliver, Audrey. The most vile martext, but Audrey. There's a youth here that in the forest that lays claim up to you. I, I, I know who tis. He hath no interest in me in the world. Here comes the man you mean. Ah, it is my meat and drink to see me a clown. By my troth, we have good wits so much to answer for. We should be flouting we cannot hold. <laughs> good evening, Audrey. God, you good even, William. Uh, and good evening to you, sir. Good even, gentle. Friend, cover the head. Cover the head. Prithee, be covered. How old are you, friend? Five and twenty, sir. Oh, a ripe age. Mm. And is thy name William? William, sir. Ah, oh, a fair name. And was born here in, in the forest here? Aye, sir, I, I thank God. Oh, thank God. Oh, good answer. Up, Rich. Uh, faith, sir, so-so. Oh, so-so is good. Very good, very excellent good. Yes, it is not. It is but so-so. No. Oh, how wise. Aye, sir, I, I have a pretty wit. Why, thou sayest well. Now... I do remember a saying, ooh, the fool doth think he is wise, but the wise man knows himself to be a fool. Do you uh, love this maid? Oh, I do, sir. Mm. Give me a hand. Ooh. <laughs> Art thou learned? Uh, no, sir. Then learn this of me. <clears throat> to have is to have. <clears throat> for, it is fit, for it is a figure in rhetoric that drink being poured out of a cup into a glass that by filling one doth filling one doth empty the <laughs> Oh shit. <clears throat> that by filling one doth empty the other. <clears throat> For your writers do consent that Ipse is he. Now you are not Ipse, but I am he. 
Which is he, sir? He, sir, that must marry this woman. Uh, oh. Therefore, you, clown, abandon, which is in the vulgar leave, the society, which is in the boorish company of this female, which in the common is woman, which altogether uh. is abandon the society of this female. Or, clown, thou perish. Perished, perishest, 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 or to thy better understanding, die. Is to thy wit, I will kill thee, make thee away, translate thy life into death, liberty in thy bondage. I will deal in poison with thee, or in bastidano, or in steel. I will Randy with the infection. I will overrun thee with policy. I will kill thee a hundred and fifty different ways. Therefore, tremble and depart. Do good, William. God rest you merry, sir. Our master and mistress seek to come away, away. Oh, uh, trip, trip, Audrey. I attend. I attend. Exeunt. Act five, scene two. Another part of the forest of Arden. Enter Orlando with arm in a sling and Oliver. Is it possible that on so little acquaintance you should like her? That but seeing you should love her and loving woo and wooing she should grant. And will you persever to enjoy her? And neither call the giddiness of it in question, the poverty of her, the small acquaintance, my sudden wooing, nor her sudden consenting. But say with me, I love Alienina. Say with her that she loves me. Consent with both that we may enjoy each other. It shall be to your good. For my father's house and all the revenue that was old Sir Rowland's will I estate upon you, and here live and die a shepherd. You have my consent. <laughs> <laughs> Let your wedding be tomorrow. Thither will I invite the Duke and all's contented followers. Go you and prepare Aliena. For look you, here comes my Rosalind. God save you, brother. And you? Fair sister. Oh, my dear Orlando, how it grieves me to see thy wear thy heart in a scarf. It is my arm. Oh, I thought thy heart had been wounded with the claws of a lion. Wounded it is, but with the eyes of a lady. Did your brother tell you how I counterfeited a swoon when he showed me your handkerchief? Aye, and greater. Oh. I know where you are, nay, tis true, for your brother and my sister no sooner met, but they looked, no sooner looked, but they loved, no sooner loved, but they sighed, no sooner sighed, but they asked one another the reason, no sooner knew the reason, but they sought the remedy, and in these degrees have they made a pair of stairs to marriage, which they will climb incontinent, or else be incontinent before marriage. They are in the very wrath of love, and they will together. Clubs cannot part them. They shall be married tomorrow, and I will bid the Duke to the nuptial. But, oh, how bitter a thing it is to look into happiness through another man's eyes. By so much the more shall I tomorrow be at the height of heart heaviness, by how much I shall think my brother happy in having what he wishes for. Why then, tomorrow I cannot serve your turn for Rosalind? I can live no longer by thinking. I'll weary you then no longer with idle talking. Know of me then, for now I speak to some purpose. That I know you are a gentleman of good conceit. I speak not this, that you should bear a good opinion of my knowledge, insomuch I say, I know you are. Neither do I labour for a greater esteem than may in some little measure draw a belief from you. To do yourself good, not, not to grace me. Believe then, if you please, that I can do strange things. I have, since I was three years old, conversed 
with a magician, most profound in his art, and yet not damnable. If you do love Rosalind, so near the heart as your gesture cries it out, when your brother marries Aliena, shall you marry her? I, I know into what straits of fortune she is driven, and it is not impossible to me, if it appear not inconvenient to you, to set her before your eyes tomorrow, human as she is, and without any danger. You can start with sober meanings. But my life, I, I do. Which I tender dearly, though I say I am a magician. <laughs> Therefore, put you in your best array. Bid your friends, for if you will be married tomorrow, you shall. And to Rosalind, if you will. Look, here comes a lover of mine and a lover of hers. Youth, you have done me much ungentleness to show the letter that I writ to you. I care not if I have. It is my study to seem despiteful and ungentle to you. You are there followed by a faithful shepherd. Look upon him. Love him. He worships you. Good shepherd, tell this youth what tis to love. It is to be all made of sighs and tears. And so am I for Phoebe. And I for Ganymede. And I for Rosalind. And I for no woman. It is to be all made of faith and service. And so am I for Phoebe. And I for Ganymede. And I for Rosalind. And I for no woman. It is to be all made of fantasy. All made of passion. And all made of wishes. All adoration. Duty and observance all humbleness, all patience and impatience, all purity, all trial, all observance. And so am I for Phoebe. And so am I for Ganymede. Oh. I for Rosalind. And so am I for no woman. If this be so, why blame you me to love you? If this be so, why blame you me to love you? This be so, why blame you me to love you? Who do you speak to? Why blame you me to love you? You heard that is not here, nor doth not here. Pray you no more of this. Tis like the howling of Irish wolves against the moon. I will help you if I can. I would love you if I could. Meet me all tomorrow. I will marry you if ever I marry woman, and I'll be married tomorrow. I will satisfy you if ever I satisfied man, and you shall be married tomorrow. I will content you if what pleases you contents you, and you shall be married tomorrow. As you love Rosalind, meet. As you love Phoebe, meet. And as I love no woman, I'll meet. Fare you well. I have left you commands. I'll not fail if I live. Nor I. Nor I. <laughs> Exeunt. Act 5, Scene 3, another part of the Forest of Arden. Enter Touchstone and Audrey. Tomorrow is the joyful day, Audrey. Tomorrow we will be married. I do desire it with all my heart, and I hope that it is no dishonest desire to desire to be a woman of the world. Uh, here come two of the banished Duke's pages. Oh, well met, honest gentleman. By my troth, well met. Come, sit, sit, and a song. We are for you. Sit in the middle. Or shall we clap into it roundly without hawking or, or, or spitting or, or saying we are hoarse, which are the only prologues to a bad voice? In faith, in faith, and both in a tune like two gypsies on a horse. Um, <clears throat> that's a note. It was a lover and his lass with a hey and a ho and a hey, nonny no. And a hey, nonny no, 
That uh, the green cornfield did pass in the springtime. In the springtime. The only pretty ringtone when birds do sing. Hey, ding a ding ding. Sweet lovers love the spring. Between the acres of the rye with a hay and a ho and a hey, nonny no. And a hey, nonny no. These pretty country folks would lie in the springtime. In the springtime. The only pretty ringtime when birds do sing. Hey, ding a ding ding. Sweet lovers love the spring. This carol they began that hour with a hey and a ho and a hey, nonny no. And a hey, nonny no. How that a life was but a flower in the springtime. In the springtime. The only pretty ringtime when birds do sing. Hey, ding a ding ding. Sweet lovers love the spring. And therefore take the present time with a hey and a ho and a hey, nonny no. Oh, clock. And a hey, nonny no. For love is crowned like a prime in the springtime. Oh, in the springtime. The only pretty ringtime when birds do sing. Hey, ding a ding ding. Sweet lovers love the spring. Wow. Wow. Amazing. Really? Young gentlemen. Wow, there was no great matter in the ditty, yet the note was very untunable. Oh, you are deceived, sir. We kept time. We we kept we we lost not our time. We <laughs> by my troth. Yes. I count it, but time lost is to hear such a foolish song. God buy you and God mend your voices. Come, Audrey. Exeunt. Act 5, Scene 4, another part of the Forest of Arden. Enter Duke Senior, Amiens, Jakes, Orlando, Oliver, Celia. Dost thou believe, Orlando, that the boy can do all this that he hath promised? I sometimes do believe, and sometimes do not, as those that fear they hope, and know they fear. Patience once more, whilst our compact is urged. You say... If I bring in your Rosalind, you will bestow her on Orlando here. That would I, had I kingdoms to give to her. And you say you will have her when I bring her. That would I, if I of all kingdoms was king. You say you'll marry me if I be willing. That will I, should I die the hour after. But if you do refuse to marry me, you'll give yourself to this most faithful shepherd. So is the bargain. <laughs> You say that you'll have Phoebe, if she will. Uh, to have her and death were both one thing. I have promised to make all this matter even. Keep you, you your word, O oh Duke, to give you your daughter. You, yours, Orlando, to receive his daughter. Or else, keep you your word, Phoebe, that you'll marry me. Or else, refusing me to wed this shepherd. Keep your word, Silvius, that you'll marry her, if she refuse me, and from hence I go to make all these doubts even. I do remember in this shepherd boy some lively touches of my daughter's favour. My lord, the first time that I ever saw him, me thought he was a brother to your daughter. But, my good lord, this boy is forest-born and hath been tutored in the rudiments of many desperate studies by his uncle, whom he reports to be a great magician obscured in the circle of this forest. There is sure to be another flood towards, and these couples are coming to the ark. Here comes a pair of very strange beasts, which in all tongues are called fools. Salutation and greeting to you all. Good my lord, bid him welcome. This is the motley-minded gentleman that I have so often met in the forest. He hath been a courtier, he swears. Oh, oh if anyone doubt that, let him put me to my purgitation. I have trod a measure. I have flattered a lady. I have been politic, politic, with my friend, smooth with mine enemy. I have undone three tailors. I have had four quarrels and like to have fought one. And how was that enough? Mm, faith, we found. We met, we found the quarrel, and it was upon the seventh cause. How? 
seventh cause. Good, my lord, like this fellow. I like him very well. Oh, God ailed you, sir. I desire you of the like. Now, I press in here, sir, among the rest of the country, copulatives, to swear and to forswear according to the marriage binds and blood breaks. A poor virgin, sir. An ill-favoured thing, sir, but mine own. A poor humour of mine, sir, to take that no man else will. For rich honesty dwells in me like a miser, sir, in a poor house as your pearl and your foul oyster. By my faith, he is very swift and sententious. Oh, according to the fool's fault, sir, and just a dulcet disease. But for the seventh cause, how did you find the quarrel on the seventh cause? Ah. <clears throat> Upon a lie, the seven times removed, fabled and more seemingly ordering. And thus, sir, I did dislike the cut of a certain courtier's beard. Now he sent me word that if I said his beard was not well cut, he was in the mind that it was. This is called retort courteous. If I sent him word again that it was not well cut, he would send me word he cut it to please himself. This is called the quip modest. If again it was not cut, he disabled my judgment. This is called reply churlish. And if again it was not well cut, he would answer, I speak not true. This is called the reproof valiant. If was not well cut. He would say, I lie. Now this is called counter check quarrelsome and so too lie circumstantial and the lie direct. And how often did you say his beard was not well cut? Oh, I durst go no further than lie circumstantial, nor durst he give me the lie direct. And so we measured swords and parted. Can well, you nominate in order now the degrees of the lie? <sighs> Sir, we quarrel in print by the book, as you have good have you, uh, la, 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 as you have books for good manners. I will name you the degrees. <clears throat> the first retort courteous, the second quit modest, the third reply churlish, the fourth reproof valiant, the fifth counter check bosom, the sixth lie with circumstance, the seventh lie direct. Oh, all of these you may find, you may avoid, but the lie direct. You may avoid that too with an if. I knew when the seven justices could not make up a quarrel, but when the parties met themselves, one of them but thought of an if as, but if you say so, then I say so. Then they shook hands, swore brothers, and your if is the only peacemaker. Much virtue in if. Is not this a rare fellow, my lord? He's as good at, at anything, and yet a fool. He uses his folly like a stalking horse, and under the presentation of that, he shoots his wit. Then is there mirth in heaven, when earthly things made even atone together. Good Duke, receive thy daughter. Hymen from heaven brought her, yea, brought her hither, that thou mightst join her hand with his, whose heart within his bosom is. To you I give myself, for I am yours. <laughs> to you I give myself, for I am yours. There be truth in sight, you are my daughter. There be truth in sight, you are my Rosalind. Sight and shape be true, why then my lover do? I'll have no father if you be not he. I'll have no husband if you be not he. Nor ne'er wed a woman if you be not she. <laughs> Peace, ho, oh. I bar confusion. Tis I must make conclusion of these most strange events. Here's eight that must take hands to join in Hymen's bands if truth holds true contents. You and you, no cross shall part. 
You and you are heart in heart. You to his love must accord or have a woman to your Lord. You and you are sure together as the winter to foul weather. While the wedlock hymn we sing, feed yourselves with questioning as reason wonder may diminish how thus we met and these things finish. My dear niece, welcome thou art to me, even daughter, welcome in no less degree. I will not eat my word, now thou art mine, thy faith my fancy to thee doth combine. <laughs> Let me have audience for a word or two. I am the second son of old Sir Roland, that bring these tidings to this fair assembly. Duke Frederick, hearing how that every day men of great worth resorted to this forest, addressed a mighty power, which were on foot in his own conduct, purposely to take his brother here and put him to the sword. And to the skirts of this wild wood he came, where, meeting with an old religious man, after some questions with him, was convert converted both from his enterprise and from the world. His crown bequeathing to his banished brother. <laughs> and all their lands resorted to them again, that were with him exiled. Yes. This to be true, I do engage my life. Welcome, young man. Thou offerest fairly to thy brother's wedding. To one his lands withheld, and to, to the other a land itself at large, a potent dukedom. First, in this forest, let us do those ends, that here we were well begun and well begot. And after every of this happy number that have endured shrewd days and nights with us, shall share the good of our returned fortune, according to the measure of their states. Meantime, forget this new fallen dignity and fall into our rustic revelry. Play music and you brides and bridegrooms all with measure heaped in joy to the measure's fall. So, by your patience, if I heard you rightly, the Duke hath put on a religious life and thrown into neglect the pompous court. He hath. To him will I. Out of these combatites, there is much matter to be heard and learned. You, to your former honour, I bequeath. Your patience and your virtue well deserves it. You, to a love that your true faith doth merit. You, to your land and love and great allies, you to a long and well-deserved bed, and you to wrangling for thy loving voyages, but for two months victualled. So, to your pleasures, I am for other than for dancing measures. Stay, Jakes, stay. Uh, to see no pastime, I... I... <laughs> Proceed. Proceed. We'll begin these rites as we do trust they'll end in true delights. <laughs>
It is not the fashion to see the lady the epilogue, but it is no more unhandsome than to see the lord the prologue. If it be true that a good wine needs no bush, then it is true. A good play needs no epilogue, but a good wine they do use good bushes, and a good play is made the better by the help of a good epilogue. What a case am I in then, <laughs> that I'm neither a good epilogue nor cannot insinuate with you on the behalf of a good play. I am not furnished like a beggar, therefore to beg will not become me. My way is to conjure you, and I'll start with the women. I charge you, oh women, for the love you bear to men, to like as much of this play as please you. And I charge you, oh men, for the love you bear to women, for I perceive by your simpering that none of you hates them, that between you and the women, the play may please. Were I a woman, I would kiss as many of you as had beards that pleased me, complexions that liked me, and breaths that I divide not. And I am sure that as many of you as have good beards, good faces, sweet breaths, will, for my kind offer, when I make curtsy, bid me farewell. Exit. <laughs> And there we are. Congratulations to all. Get up and back out here. Take a bow. Give yourselves a massive round of applause. Congratulations, everybody. That was absolutely amazing. <laughs> amazing, amazing. I had a great time watching that. Uh, and to those watching all around the world at home right now, thank you for joining us and allow me to introduce you to the cast and crew, starting as always with our incredible producer, Sarah Peachy. Hi everyone, I'm Sarah. I'm an actor and innovation project manager based in Glasgow. Our associate director, stage manager and master of props, Emily Ingram. Hi, I'm Emily. I'm a director, writer and pentagram creator in Edinburgh. <laughs> <laughs> On music and sound, it's Daniel Blaker. Hi everyone, I'm Dan. I'm the sound designer and engineer and I'm based in Dorset. And movement and fight director, Enric Ortuño. Hi everyone, uh, I'm a fight director, movement director and intimacy director based in London, UK. Fabulous, and our cast for tonight put together as always by the amazing Sydney Aldridge. They put on an incredible show for you here tonight and here they are as Rosalind Phoebe Elliott. Hi, Phoebe Elliott, I'm an actor from London. As Orlando, Michael Ahomka Lindsay. Hi, I'm Michael Ahomka Lindsay. I'm an actor, musician and writer from West London, but training in Glasgow. As Celia, Tamsin Lines. Hi, I'm Tamsin Lines. I'm an actor and singer from London. As Jakes, <laughs> Alexandra Kataigida. I am Alexandra Kataigida. I uh, act, stage manager, and coordinate violence professionally everywhere. As Duke Senior, Austin Titchener. Hi, I'm Austin Titchener. I'm an actor, playwright, and co artistic director of the Reduced Shakespeare Company, and I sing hello from Chicago. As Oliver, Candice Handy. Hi, I'm Candice Handy. I'm an actor based in Cincinnati, Ohio. As Touchstone, Nat Kennedy. Hello, I'm Nat Kennedy. I'm an actor based in London, but originally from Liverpool. As Phoebe, Valerie Andrews. Hi, my name is Valerie Andrews. I am an actor and producer located in Glasgow, but originally from Guatemala. As Silvius, Jason Blackwater. I am Jason Blackwater. I'm an actor, improviser, voice actor from Brighton, UK, currently based in Orlando, Florida. As Duke Frederick, Alice Langrish. Hi, I'm Alice Langrish. I'm an actor and youth worker in Twickenham, near London. As Adam, Leo Atkin. Hi, I'm Leo. I'm an actor based in the wilds of Lancashire. As Corinne, Philippa Hammond. Hi, I'm Philippa Hammond, actor, voice artist based in Brighton. As Amians, Danny Adams. Hi, I'm Danny Adams. I am an actor musician based out of New York City. 
as First Lord, David Ellis. Hello there, I'm David Ellis uh, and I'm an actor, writer and comedian uh, based in London and Bedford. And our ensemble for this evening, first of all, Rebecca Bruff. Hi, I'm Rebecca Bruff and I'm an actor based in London. David Martinez. I am David Martinez. I'm an actor and biologist based in Kansas City in the US. <laughs> Still in full hymen mode as well. We'd love to see it. Margaret Catch. <laughs> Hi, I'm Margaret Catch. I am a screenwriter, director, and actor based in Los Angeles. Fergus Rattigan. Hi, I'm Fergus Rattigan. I'm an Irish actor and actor combatant based in London. Luke Hayes. Hello there, my name's Luke Hayes. I'm an actor and child stuntman, and I'm based in South End, Essex. And our fabulous swings for this evening, who you might have seen glimpses of through the show, Will <laughs> Gillum. Hi, I'm Will Gillam. I'm a London-based actor, originally from East Sussex. And Rhiannon Willans. Hi, I'm Rhiannon Willans, and I'm an actor, poet and singer, if you can believe it, uh, based in Kent. <laughs> oh, I can believe it. Fantastic work. And Duck Wrangler as well. Always lovely to see. Uh, our swings, of course, in the event of technical difficulties or personal emergencies, would have swung in to keep the story moving forward. Uh, but uh, although it looked like it might happen a couple of times, uh, I think we had plain sailing most of the way through that. So congratulations to everyone's respective internet service providers. Uh, it is still not too too late to bring a friend to the Sherpas Go Online. You can copy and paste this link and share it on your social media tonight or tomorrow and it will be available to view now and for all time. Please do like this video, subscribe to the channel uh, and uh, what's the other one? Share reactions on social media using the hashtag Sherpas Go Online at TSMG Online Live on Twitter and at the Sherpas Go Online on Insta and Facebook. And that is all my bump. We are done. Congratulations everyone. Well done. Uh, we would now love to hear your questions, audience. If you have questions for us, please get those in. Thank you so much. How's everybody feeling? <laughs> I'll have uh, one question, actually. Um, oh, go for it. Everyone. So, um, uh, as, as we've mentioned, and, and uh, many of you watching will, will know um, that all of our lovely cast uh, for this week's show are alumni uh, from our season three. Um, so from our uh, recent few shows, um, most of those shows have been histories. Um, so the question was, what has your experience been like doing a comedy? Um, uh, were there any things that you didn't expect to be a challenge that were um, um, anything that was more fun than you were expecting? Anyone want to go first? <laughs> well, I'll just say that I like that there's more comedy in As You Like It than there is in King John. <laughs> right, right way around, really. <laughs> yeah, that's true. Yeah, finish on high. <laughs> I'd say it's been really fun. I mean, the flow of ideas has been really interesting, sort of in a rehearsal and suddenly someone has like, this crazy idea and they just kind of just take it on because it's a comedy, like, yeah, let's do it. Um, so, yeah, it's definitely been fun. I'm just glad that I don't have a red nose anymore. <laughs> also, I think the epic amount of foliage in this one has been has been fun. The, the leaf, the leafage. Absolutely, absolutely. You've all done incredible work decorating your spaces. My word. I'm going to go and replant galore. everything now. <laughs> I think somebody did ask uh, in the chat during the show, Leo. Did you yeah. bring a trellis in from outside? I think that must have been my wife. She knows <laughs> I brought it in. <laughs> it is. It's a it's a freestanding trellis, you know, and uh, good old plastic flowers. There you are. Fabulous, fabulous. Uh, we've got a great question here from Ian Desher, no less. Um, do any of you think uh, there's a moment prior to the final reveal when Orlando realizes the trick Rosalind as Ganymede is playing? I think that's probably a good one to start with uh, our uh, wonderful Phoebe and Michael. Uh, yeah, well, we, I mean, this is your question, Michael, you go. <laughs> uh, I, I would say it's sort of after Oliver has that conversation with them and he tells her the story and, you know, all this stuff happens and he kind of susses out, she susses out what, the, what trick is being played here. Um, and uh, they come back and I think they tell Orlando and all that. From then it's like, ah, oh, okay. I've yeah, and Oliver that. does literally call her Rosalind in front of Orlando. <laughs> so <laughs> he, if he doesn't guess, then he's really, really slow. <laughs> 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 
Poetry that wouldn't be far fetched. Fabulous. <laughs> 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 it's yeah, for me, it's the line I and greater wonders than that. That was the one that when I read it, and then I look back over that Oliver exchange after the faint as well, it really seemed to me like there was a strong case to suggest that actually uh, they were that uh, Orlando was kind of going along with it at this point. Um, and we really enjoyed uh, through rehearsal, or at least I really enjoyed, uh, mostly as an audience member, uh, just the sense of chemistry and playfulness that very quickly gets established between Ganymede, uh, as was, and Orlando, and the fact that those two can so easily get carried away together. Uh, and the fact that they continue to get carried away together, uh, and that the game is more fun than the truth, I think is an interesting uh, thing to play, to let uh, Rosalind come to terms with it in her own time, I suppose. Um, uh, I'd love to throw this over actually to you, Rachel. Uh, I just wondered whether you had thoughts on that. Yeah, um, these kinds of questions really just depend on the, the dramaturg and the, the director, what you guys want to do in this particular text in your interpretation of it. I think that um, if you were to have it in front of you on paper, it would be very clear. Um, how it gets played out depends on like, what you're watching, what you're listening to, if you're checking your phone at that exact moment that it comes out, um, which is really what I love about live theater. So, you know, we as the people putting on the show can know as much as we want. Whether or not the audience receives that knowledge from us is completely out of our hands. <laughs> Absolutely, yeah. I, and I think that's one of the great things about theatre as opposed to film, as you say, is the fact that we don't choose the story that gets told. We just put it in front of people and they bring more of themselves to the table, really, don't they? Yeah, fabulous. Sarah, do we have any more questions? Uh, yes. So there's one I just want to address because a couple of people have asked it, um, uh, which is lovely because I'm assuming it's new people in the audience. Uh, yeah. So welcome. <laughs> I hope you've enjoyed it. So a couple of people have asked, how did you learn the lines? <laughs> <laughs> so, um, <laughs> good job, everyone. Good job. <laughs> yes. Learned it all, rehearsed it in two and a half days. Easy, snap. Uh, no, so the big secret is though, th this is a performed reading. So, everyone um, that is in the show has the script up on their screens um, and they are, in fact, reading it <laughs> as part of the live show. On top of doing everything else, fantastic performances building and manipulating props, creating songs and singing them and um, doing wrestling matches and all sorts of things. So yes, massive kudos to, to all of you. <laughs> um, so I have got um, another question here. Um, so it's actually one that it would be great to start back with you, Rachel, again, but um, someone has asked, what's the deal with Hyman? I mean, listen, that's like between you and your doctor, but I can give you, <laughs> um, I'll do my best. So I'm sorry, that was um, a low blow. Also um, in the same vein, actually speaking of low blows, um, Hyman, being the god of, of marriage and um, subsequently of consummation um, is just the name of the gods. So um, if you're not familiar with the play, if you're not familiar with the world of the play, a character appearing with hymen written in all caps on the name badge might be a little bit disorienting, um, but not only is that the name of the character, but the appearance of a very obscure Romanesque God is pretty common in Shakespeare plays. So that's one for kind of, uh, it's, a good, it's a good question. Um, it may seem superficial, but it really like is, has very deep roots in Shakespeare. So that's a good one. So here's a follow-up question to that then, Rachel. Have we seen the last of Hyman? Ooh, are you <laughs> suggesting that there could be a sequel called <laughs> As You Like It Too, The Hymening? In so, um, Hyman is pretty shady towards some of the couples. So we're looking at maybe like divorces, second marriages. So I think I think that Hyman could could make a return, <laughs> um, dramaturgically speaking. <laughs> wonderful, wonderful. I'm glad I'm glad we've cleared that up. <laughs> you know, as someone with two thirds of a PhD, I think that. 
<laughs> Marvelous. Sarah, do we have any more questions? <laughs> I love it. Uh, yes. Um, so, um, oh, so I've got a question here for Valerie. Um, someone's asked, how did you choose to play Phoebe's final scene and her ending up with Sylvius? Um, that's a, a great one that was actually solved in a very feminist way. Um, so we decided to use, is it the flower from Midsummer's? Yes. So seeing that Phoebe would completely and utterly refuse to marry Sylvius in any context, we decided that she needed to be bewitched in order for that to be plausible. So Hyman comes and, you know, gives her her happiness, albeit fake, but still, you know, it's, it, I, I thought it was a great way to justify it. <laughs> it was certainly one of those things that we had to try and justify because it did feel like it came out of absolutely nowhere. And I think Sylvius needs to keep him Not away from nowhere. white. Oh, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> no shade on your or Jason, but uh, yeah, it, I think he's got to keep her away from white flowers uh, for the rest of his life, uh, or there'll be trouble. Wonderful. Any more questions, Sarah? Uh, yes. So I have got. Um, oh, uh, so there was a question here. Obviously, we had a, a. It was practically a musical. This this play. <laughs> so so much uh, sort of singing and dancing in it. So I've got. Um, one question, which is, how did you get the singing together without lag? <laughs> yeah, it's one of the one of the prevailing mysteries of doing Zoom theatre is how to synchronise voices. You may have noticed that there were some synchronised voices punching through in the wrestling as well. Uh, the answer to that is very simply layering. So we. Uh, got uh, the lads to do the wrestling match in one of the rehearsals and we uh, filmed it, recorded that Zoom rehearsal. We sent it to all of the actors and we asked them all to send us individually their reactions to the wrestling happening, all their oohs and ahs, all their boos and cheers, uh, all their chants and whatnot. Uh, and then we had to uh, quite laboriously stack them, one on top of another, 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 and so on. Uh, and then we had to uh, put in dips in that uh, for where the actual lines from Celia and uh, Rosalind punch through. Uh, that went over to our wonderful sound designer, Dan Blaker, who then added in uh, uh, extra kind of crowd atmos and extra reactions and things like that and put that kind of uh, po professional polish on it. Uh, we've got our lovely wrestling bells, our count of one, two, three for the pinfall, all that kind of stuff. And that was essentially uh, one track then that had been compressed from about sort of 16. Uh, and the same was true for the choral song for Hyman at the end. Uh, so we got everybody to sing it individually. And then we layer them all on top of each other. And I am amazed that all of the actors managed to keep it within <laughs> as close a timing as they did. Quite impressive, genuinely. So well done, everyone, for that. Uh, and what you were seeing, a little bit like, uh, I'm trying to think of a more modern reference, but I don't have one. Britney Spears uh, was lip sync. Uh, so yes, that was all just a little bit of theatre trickery. But uh, any of the songs that were either solos or duets were performed live with the instruments or in some cases with the ducks <laughs> uh, and so those were performed live it was just that group song at the end fabulous <laughs> cool so i've got um an, a question here um which would be good to throw over um to alexandra so the question is how do you decide how to interpret the stage speech um person said it was very fresh Sorry, could you repeat that? Yeah, of course. So the question was, how did you decide to interpret the stage speech? So the, the seven stages of man? Yes. Um, with the glorious and kind of uh, fantastic aid of Rob, <laughs> basically. Um, you, we played around, we had a crack at it. We, you know, you kind of go for a first pancake, everything's going to be terrible, but it's the first. Um, and then we looked back at it and went, okay, what which bits of this are reflective of whom? Who are you, whom are you persiflating at what point? Um, and also, you know, what's kind of, where does this come from? You know, and it's kind of presented as this great big purple speech, but it probably just comes to the character in the moment. 
you know, um, it's actually the Duke that that seeds that idea, as as Rob is kindly nodding, because yeah, that he that was something wonderful that he pointed out. It was like it's it's a it's just something that torrentially comes from the Duke's idea, and then you have to list the seven stages because you've named them, you know. Yeah, and I think also the the idea that he doesn't know how it's going to end and then they you know he gets there um i also found very interesting and, and fun to play awesome thanks so much alexandra sarah do we have any more questions yes so um i've got uh one here actually for enrique um oh, so someone was asking how did you rehearse the dancing <laughs> uh ah good question um I think I don't know, like like everything, with uh, with uh, loads of ingenuity and loads of willingness from the actors. I have to say, so uh, we just met in a rehearsal. We started searching from Kaylee's, uh, and and my amazing knowledge of Kaylee's <laughs> being Spanish. Uh, so I yeah, so we just uh, draw from the collective knowledge of the of the group and decide to we start creating some stuff. We put some music, then we then uh, we use some like like placeholder music from YouTube, and then we gave it to our sound designer Daniel and then he created something new uh, and we had to re uh, rehearse the new music uh, so there's several videos of me just tutor like as, as a tutorial talking to myself uh, singing and dancing the, the dance um, yeah I don't know it's just a uh, ingenuity fun willingness and and that tutorial video will be available as a Patreon exclusive. So <laughs> sign up to the Patreon to see how Enrique teaches people how to dance. It is quite something. No, it's not. <laughs> no, it's not. Don't sign up. Don't sign up, please. please do, not, do not sign up to the Patreon. <laughs> I forbid you to sign up to the Patreon. <laughs> marvellous, marvellous. Any more questions, Sarah? Um, so the other thing, actually, just sticking with you, Nareet, was um, uh, people were asking lots of questions about the fight. So it'd be great if you could tell us a bit more about all of the brilliant uh, fight moments that we had in this show. Uh, again, I don't know. I, 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 I'm, this week, I literally did nothing. It was all the actors again. It was all, it's true. It was all the actors. It was Rob. I mean, we just put everything together. We had the ideas of the legs that I used with Yarit for, um, for Timmy of this rule. We came with the idea of using like a fey leg so we repurposed the idea of the fey legs to try and get some legs going around for for child's arrested from luke and you know we just tried to went full on with the rib shirts and and the mass and 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 and, uh, and the power bomb and and the boston crap i mean it's i, I i'm still surprised i'm gonna say like kudos charles luke michael fucking amazing sorry <laughs> <laughs> Freaking amazing. Freaking amazing. Moving Jesus. swiftly on, uh, Luke and Michael, how was it performing Jesus. one half of a wrestling match uh, hundreds oh, of miles own. away from each other? Yeah. Um, I tell you what, it's something that will probably never happen again. But it's, <laughs> it's, but it's, it's for for a good thing. Like like I've like normally I'm as a, as being a, a child stuntman, I'm normally you know quite seen. Uh, like I'm small, I'm tiny. So me playing this like big behemoth Charles. It's something that will never ever happen again to me. So I normally am the one that gets that gets thrown about the place all the time. So the, the, so the only times where I felt myself was when I flung myself backwards and just spaffed on the floor. Um, so so for me, it's something that that I'm quite happy with doing. Um, and it was it, it was strange because obviously there's like a little bit of lag um, between both of the screens. So um, you know for for me and Michael, it was almost like we almost had to like hold certain moves a little bit longer. To see a reaction to then pull away to then to do it again or you know the big sort of power slam as well it's like it's like i i have him up for the power bomb and then i have to almost like look at the screen just to almost give like michael a sort of nod to go yeah now and then try and do it at the same sort of time so it's it's interesting it's interesting i i really enjoyed it i don't know I don't know about michael my my internet just dropped out perfect timings i, I just missed the beginning ah! I don't know if you noticed, I just disappeared. <laughs> <laughs> no, so the question was, how was it performing in a wrestling match a hundred miles away from your opponent? <laughs> I find it really fun. It was, it, was, it was a good time rehearsing and trying to, you know, get it together. Um, we kind of got all our sort of ways of really, like knowing what we're going to do next and, and all. Um, really funny though, I, I used nail varnish to, to stick 
like some parts of my mask together. And so I kid you not, there was a moment where I thought I was about to faint because the smell of the nail varnish <laughs> was like, so when I, when I, I fell down after the clothesline, I genuinely was like, <gasps> it was really intense, um, but it was really fun. So. <laughs> I have to say, I have to say, I'm so glad that the vest ripped properly. Cause I was, I was so worried. Cause we hadn't, we haven't practiced that before any runs. Cause I only had, I only had one like old vest. So I was like, we'll wait and see, we'll wait and see. And luckily it just absolutely tore to pieces. And I was like, yeah, yes! <laughs> that's yes! a good omen. <laughs> I'm big, I'm big, I'm huge, which is not normal for me. <laughs> oh, fantastic. Thank you both so much for that. Sarah, any more questions? I think that's all for tonight. Wonderful, yeah. fantastic. Well, thank you all so much for joining us. Uh, thank you to our incredible cast and crew, as always, for another amazing show and a superb way uh, to finish off season three. Uh, excited already for the beginning of season four, which starts with none other than Hamlet, <laughs> which we are going to do. Uh, we're doing a very special cast for Hamlet. We're doing an all a grand alumni cast is probably the best way to put it. So we're drawing on alumni from all of the seasons so far uh, for Hamlet. And it's going to be an amazing celebration. Really looking forward to bringing that to you. So please do like this video, subscribe to the channel, uh, copy and paste this link and send it to your friends uh, via email, via Facebook, via Twitter, via Instagram. Spread the word and get people back here uh, next week for arguably the most famous play of all time, William Shakespeare's Hamlet. Thank you, everyone, and good night.